Good morning, and I want to thank the witnesses for joining today's hearing on the implementation of the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018. Uh, one year ago, this committee wrote comprehensive bipartisan legislation to raise the bar on aviation safety, improve the flying experience for the traveling public, better prepare and diversify the aviation workforce, and foster innovation in the U.S. airspace. Today's hearing is a critical milestone in the subcommittee's oversight work to ensure the timely Im implementation of the law in accordance with our intent and to address new challenges. Although the FAA has made some progress on fulfilling the law's directives, ongoing implementation delays threaten the important work needed to advance U.S. aviation and aerospace and maintain our global leadership. Our first panel of witnesses are Dan Elwell, the FAA's Deputy Administrator, and Joel Zabat, Acting Undersecretary for Policy at the Department of Transportation. Mr. Elwell and Mr. Zabat, I do expect your testimony will offer substantive updates on the administration's efforts to swiftly implement uh, last year's law. I would note they're joined by staff from FAA and DOT, and uh, the staff will be available for, uh, to help us answer any of our questions as well. Witnesses on today's second panel reflect a broad range of aviation stakeholders who are uniquely positioned to comment on what is working, what is not, and what Congress can do to keep the FAA and DOT on track. I expect we'll cover a lot of ground today, so let me walk briefly through a few of my priorities. Safety is the subcommittee's top priority. The FAA's current aerospace forecast predicts passenger traffic will increase roughly 2% per year over the next 20 years. Congress must ensure appropriate safety rules are in place to safely accommodate this demand. Notably, the lack of modern rest requirements for flight attendants remains a critical aviation safety issue. The current regulation issued in 1994 allows airlines to roster flight attendants for just eight hours of rest. Instead of modifying the 94 rule on flight attendant rest to provide at least 10 hours of rest by November 4th of last year, as directed in the bill, the FAA just this week issued an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, ANPRM, soliciting comments on the costs and benefits of compliance with the mandate. I'm concerned that this action is yet another unnecessary delay, so Mr. Elwell, I expect you to shed some more light on the FAA's decision-making related to this issue. Further, I look forward to hearing more about the necessity of the ANPRM, particularly as some 15 airlines have already implemented the mandate or are currently working towards compliance. The bill also requires the FAA to issue guidance to air crews and mechanics on responding to incidents involving smoke and, or fumes in cabins, as well as a commission uh, uh, to study um, in-cabin air quality. This, these directives are overdue, so I hope you can provide an update on how the FAA plans to fulfill these mandates. Congress as well must ensure the FAA efficiently integrate, integrates unmanned aircraft systems, or UAS, um, uh, into the uh, national airspace system. But Congress must also ensure that integration is safe. This committee made the necessary reforms in last year's bill to ensure the agency could move forward on a remote identification rule. Although rulemaking was initiative more than, initiated more than one year ago, the publication date has been repeatedly delayed. In July, I joined Chair DeFazio and Ranking Members Sam Graves and Garrett Graves on a letter to the FAA and the Office of Management and Budget, raising questions about the delays in issuing the remote ID rule, but our questions remain unanswered. So Deputy Administrator, Administrator Elwell and Mr. Zabat, I expect you will provide us with those answers today. Further, according to recent reports, the FAA, in partnership with three UAS sites, has successfully completed test flights under phase one of the UAS Traffic Management Pilot Program, and we look forward to hearing more about the lessons learned from that program to date. As the committee continues to support advances in U.S. aviation, the success of those efforts is possible with the investment in the next generation of engineers, pilots, mechanics, and innovators. The uh, Authorization Act includes a comprehensive workforce development title, including my provision to create a new task force to encourage high school students to enroll in aviation manufacturing, maintenance, and engineering apprenticeships. With global aviation becoming more competitive, I'm concerned by the FAA's lack of progress on this mandate, as well as continued delays to establish a Women in Aviation Advisory Board to encourage women and young girls to pursue aviation careers. Improving access to workforce training and diversifying the aviation workforce is an all-around win for employers, job seekers, and the aviation and aerospace sectors. And the FAA Reauthorization Act includes numerous provisions to improve the tra air travel experience for more than the 900 million passengers who fly in the U.S. each year. For years, I've championed the effort to improve accessibility of air travel for passengers with disabilities. 
and I'm pleased to see the Reauthorization Act included a robust title focused on improving the curb-to-curb -curb experience for these passengers. However, the Department's commitment to these goals has rightly been called into question as significant delays on rulemaking for several of these key mandates, per mandates persist. Moreover, the public is still waiting for final action on rulemaking to ensure passengers with disabilities can access laboratories on single-aisle airplanes, an action that um, I ask be required in the 2016 FAA extension. Additionally, last year's act improved safety for the traveling public and airline employees by addressing sexual harassment and assault through open reporting and increased accountability. There's no doubt the FAA and DOT and this committee have our work cut out for us. Timely implementation of the Long-Term Reauthorization Act will provide stability for the nation's aviation community, support the advancement of new technologies, improve American competitiveness, and above all, ensure aviation safety. So I want to thank uh, again the witnesses for being uh, here today. I look forward to the discussion. And for opening a statement, I turn to Ranking Member uh, Garrett Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for, uh, for holding this hearing. I want to thank all the witnesses for, for being here today. Uh, often we, we pass laws and move on. We send out press releases, we have signing ceremonies, and we move on. Uh, this law was signed in, uh, this bill was signed into law uh, about a year ago, almost a year ago. Uh, it includes over, over 400 pages of text, as uh, Undersecretary uh, Zabat includes in his testimony. It includes nearly 360 deliverables uh, to, the, to the Congress, to this committee, 360. Um, there's, a, there's an awful lot of, of work uh, that went into this legislation, and we need to make sure that the outcomes actually yield or represent that congressional intent. Um, the, the process of signing a bill into law is just the beginning. The reality is that implementation is, is everything, as is the case in, in many circumstances. Uh, this bill lays out or addresses policy debates in many long-standing uh, areas where there has been dispute or been differences or a lack of a decision. Uh, it truly lays the groundwork for the future of aviation and the future of aviation infrastructure. Um, this legislation uh, makes a lot of progress in terms of addressing the future of aviation safety, how that applies not just to the aircraft but also to the to the uh, information systems and the on-the-ground networks as well. This bill was a bipartisan bill. Uh, strong, strong support from Republicans and Democrats. Uh, strong vote in the House of Representatives moving forward, but I want to say it again. All of this is for naught if the FAA doesn't do what we directed them to do in the first place. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm glad we're holding this hearing today. I think that we, we need to ensure that we stay on top of this and stay on top of, of implementation and carry out our oversight responsibilities properly. Um, I understand uh, what has been accomplished and what still needs to be done. It's important uh, that we look to the future and decide what we're going to do next, that we fully understand the implementation of this legislation. I want to thank the witnesses in both panels for being here today and for your input. I'm interested in hearing how the FAA has implemented provisions related to the new entrance and new technologies such as unmanned uh, aerial systems, uh, aircraft systems. I also want to learn the status of numerous safety process streamlining and consumer protection efforts. Uh, thank you again, Mr. Chairman, for holding the, today's hearing and yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Mr. Graves. I turn to the chair of the full committee, Mr. DeFazio of Oregon, for five minutes. Oh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome uh, the witnesses here today. Uh, we did send a lot of mandates. Uh, the chair listed a number. I share his concerns over those, and I'll list uh, a few others that are at the top of my list. I understand uh, it was a big workload, but if you prioritize and address the principles, concerns, particularly those that relate to safety, um, you know that'll be uh, that'll be good progress. So, flight attendant fatigue, 25 years. I mean, um, you know, we the FAA has recognized that fatigue is a real issue. Uh, and that, you know, when you're dealing with safety critical personnel, pilots, we've adopted rules. When it comes to flight attendants, safety critical personnel, we haven't. The rules allow an airline to keep a flight attendant on duty for 14 hours, then you get an eight hour break. Now it's eight hours to get off the plane, get out of the airport, get on the shuttle, go to the hotel, you know, maybe make a phone call, take a shower, go to bed, get up and be back within eight hours. Now, I don't know. Uh, maybe you get three, four hours sleep, if you're lucky. Uh, so, and, you know, it's well past time. And I thought we were very, very definitive and clear, and it would not be necessary to go through a lengthy rulemaking. And I'm hoping that uh, we can expedite 
uh, that in the near future. And then um, we have the issue of cabin uh, evacuations. Uh, you know, when I first came to Congress, I was aware of the Manchester crash where people died, piled up like cordwood, trying to get out the overwing exit. It was a survival crash. It took me uh, five years in Congress uh, to get a rule uh, that said we would take out and make space uh, to get at the overwing exits. Two years later, the industry came back with a fake study saying, oh no, that actually delays evacuations if you take those seats out. Well, we pushed back on that and they didn't put them back in. But now they're cramming in more and more and more seats, closer and closer together. People are getting bigger. And we haven't done a real safety evacuation drill in, I think, 20 years or 25 years. We're using computer simulations. I don't believe we can meet the standard uh, anymore of 90 seconds, uh, which has uh, been deemed to be critical. Now, if the FAA thinks you can have five minutes in a survivable crash in a fire, well, then tell us that. But if you don't think that, then we have to find out whether or not the current rules accommodate a 90-second evacuation. We, had, uh, we have a real-life example, uh, which was uh, the uh, uh, American Airlines flight uh, in Chicago, uh, which was a uh, wide body. So it wasn't one of the new, really crammed-in uh, planes, and it took them well over uh, two minutes and 21 seconds to evacuate the plane, and the plane wasn't even full. So telling me that these new economy carriers that have crammed people in, so they're sitting like this, I, I want to get the CEOs here someday, and I'm going to get some of those seats, and I'm going to put them in them. We're going to keep them here for four or five hours uh, and see, uh, see what they think uh, about what they're doing. To I won't be chairing that meeting. <laughs> uh, secondary cockpit barriers. Uh, uh, Bill Lipinski, not Dan, uh, and I were on this issue before 9-11, the vulnerability of the flight decks. Um, and United actually installed a few barriers in 757s. I was down there visiting their maintenance facility in San Francisco once, and I said, what are that? What's, what do you call that? And they said, oh, we call those defazios, because they're bugging, you're bugging us so much. But uh, they didn't equip all the planes, and we had a preventable tragedy. Had we been able to prohibit access? Yes, we've armed the doors, and now we have flight attendants menacingly behind a cart. Uh, and it wouldn't be very hard for a person uh, with strength and skill to vault over that cart, knock the flight attendant down, take out the pilot, and get to the flight deck. That was really, really, really clear. Now, the industry is very opposed. Now, it's going to put a little more weight on the plane. And uh, the manufacturers and the former chairman tried to say, no, no, we didn't mean what the law said. Uh, we meant, uh, we meant uh, new types. No. The law is clear, all newly manufactured airplanes will have these barriers. And again, uh, you know, this is uh, being slow walked. I see that uh, they're, you know, asked for uh, another delay. They're not releasing the recommendations. We've got to get that out. Drones took, um, took me about five years to roll the very, very powerful model airplane uh, lobby and, uh, and the Chinese toy manufacturers to require that we could have remote ID. They had prohibited the FAA from regulating these things. Sooner or later, uh, we're gonna ingest a drone. What's gonna happen? Well, we don't know. In fact, I asked the FAA three years ago, what happens if one of those crappy little quadcopters uh, goes into a turbine? And they said, well, we don't know. And I said, well, maybe you we should find out. We still haven't had the live test. I don't know what the delay is, uh, but you know, this is very serious. And if this, you know, the commercial drone people are all w with me on this. It's like, because if we have one accident because of some jerk illegally flying a toy drone, they're all going to get grounded. And it's going to be quite a mess. So we really, really need that rule. And now I think we're not even going to see a proposed rule until December. You know, I don't know. Is it the model aircraft people? Is it the Chinese? Who is keeping, who's holding this up? And then finally, foreign repair stations. We just had an incident last week of uh, what appears to be uh, a terrorist action on domestic soil by a domestic employee. Uh, and, you know, I have for years, again, with Bill Lipinski, that's how long it's been, uh, expressed concerns, and with Jerry Costello, about foreign repair stations. We did some visits. 
And, uh, you know, we can't do unannounced visits because the State Department says, oh, well, then they could do unannounced visits here. Who cares? We don't have anything to hide, I hope. So, um, and we don't, they don't do drug testing as is we require by law. They don't do alcohol, drug, and they don't do background checks. And, and now we're doing massive, massive amounts of maintenance overseas. This is an incredible vulnerability. Just like this guy tried to sabotage the plane there, what about someone doing a D-check down in one of these uh, foreign repair stations? That's, a way, to, that's a, a, a way to take down a plane without having to get on board and not having to access the flight deck. So these are, these are safety critical, potentially life-threatening rules that we need, and we need them as quickly as possible. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now turn to uh, Ranking Member Graves uh, for five minutes for his opening. <clears throat> Thanks, Chairman uh, Larson and uh, Ranking Member Graves for having this hearing. I'm very glad that the subcommittee is focusing on implementation FAA reauthorization uh, for 2018. Very glad about that. Um, this act is the longest reauthorization in more than two decades, and its passage last October was very bipartisan, and it was widely praised. Um, but among other things, FAA reauthorization, uh, it gives the FAA and industry much-needed stability. It provides steady funding for airport and infrastructure across the country and allows manufacturers to get products to market on time, uh, stay competitive, and provide millions of good-paying American jobs. And it also streamlines the regulatory process to encourage innovation uh, in new technologies. And I'm particularly proud uh, in the reauthorization of the provisions that address issues important to the general avi aviation community, such as supporting small and rural airports through the new supplemental grant program, increasing aircraft registration uh, times from three years to seven years, common sense changes in FAA hangar use and policy related to the construction of an aircraft, tackling important general aviation safety issues, such as marking towers, and in FAA fees for large aviation events, such as AirVenture in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and Sun and Fun uh, in Lakeland, Florida. A clarified FAA policy relating to nonprofits uh, when it comes to accepting donations for living history flight experiences. Um, it promoted the streamlining and evaluation of regulations related to certificates for pilots of experimental aircraft, including the restoration of the all makes and models certificate and supporting programs to develop the aviation workforce uh, of the future. And this is just to name uh, a few. Um, it is vitally important that the workforce grant program, training requirements and studies directed by the law, uh, it's very important that they are implemented in a, in a timely manner. During the next seven days, um, the General Assembly of the International Civil Aviation Organization, or ICAO, uh, is gonna meet in Montreal. And I'm pleased that FAA leadership is gonna be there um, with other regulators to discuss um, international standards. And I'm also pleased that one of those items to be discussed is international pilot training standards. And I understand the United States uh, is gonna present a white paper on automation and dependency in the cockpit. And I've said before, I've said this before, and I'm gonna say it again, because I don't think it can be repeated enough, that the pilot is the most important safety feature in any cockpit, and his or her ability to fly the plane when technology fails is absolutely critical to safety. The growth of the commercial aviation industry around the world is so important to our global economy and it has numerous benefits, but that growth and rapid expansion, especially in developing nations, cannot come at the expense of safety and good training. I look forward to hearing from today's witnesses. I wish, and this isn't a criticism, Mr. Chairman, but I wish that uh, we could hear um, from other segments of the, general, or of the aviation community, such as general aviation, the airlines, manufacturers, um, airports, safety inspectors, air traffic controllers, um, the GA community. Um, so I hope today's hearing is just the first in the series uh, on the implementation of the uh, reauthorization law. And again, uh, I want to thank our witnesses um, for being here today, and I yield back the uh, balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Graves, and uh, so noted on your request. I want to welcome the witnesses uh, to our first panel, uh, Mr. Dan Elwell, Deputy Administrator of the FAA, and the Honorable Joel Jabot, Acting Undersecretary for Policy at the US DOT. Thanks for being here today. Uh, we all look forward to your testimony. Without objection, our witnesses' full statements will be included in the record. And since that is the case, uh, the subcommittee requests to limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Mr. Elwell, you are recognized. Thank you, Chairman Larson, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking member. Get close and speak up. 
Thank you, Chairman Larson, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves and Ranking Member Graves, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the FAA's ongoing work to implement the provisions of the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018. Before I begin, I'd like to recognize um, our guests today, the uh, family and friends of those who passed in uh, the accidents in Indonesia and Ethiopia. It is in honor of their loved ones that we stay so intensely committed to improving safety. Although the act authorized aviation programs for five years, the vast majority of the specific mandates require FAA action within the first year. We remain committed to completing the work you have given us, and I am pleased to report we have made substantial progress on fulfilling the mandates. I'll discuss accomplishments in several key areas, including aircraft certification, aviation safety, unmanned aircraft systems, and commercial space. The FAA's approach to aircraft certification has evolved over time in order to adapt to an ever-changing industry, with safety always paramount. Continuous improvement is an integral component of the FAA's safety culture, and we're committed to learning from our experiences and using what we've learned to improve our process. The 2018 Act furthers this work. As required in the reauthorization, Secretary Chow this summer established a 22-member Safety Oversight and Certification Advisory Committee to advise the Department on policy-level topics related to certification, including Organization Designation Authority, or ODA. The reauthorization also required the FAA to establish an ODA office within the Aviation Safety Organization to ensure consistency in ODA oversight functions throughout the agency. We formally established the ODA office in March. The 2018 Act requires the FAA to initiate 33 separate rulemakings in addition to creating new aviation rulemaking committees and expanding the work of the existing Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee, ARAC, to consider new objectives. We've made significant progress on key rulemakings, on flight attendant duty and rest periods. As the chairman mentioned, we published an advance notice of proposed rulemaking yesterday that asks respondents for data to assist us in developing the proposed rule. In a related requirement, in June, we published advisory information to airlines for developing flight attendant fatigue risk management plans. Currently, we're receiving and reviewing these plans from airlines. In June, we also directed the ARAC to evaluate a reauthorization requirement for airlines to install secondary cockpit barriers in new passenger aircraft. The FAA is committed to implementing Congress's mandate for this safety and security enhancement, and we're working with the ARAC to ensure it's done correctly. The FAA is also making good progress on several airport-related requirements, ranging from contract towers and environmental concerns with firefighting agents to streamlining the passenger facility charge program. We are acutely aware of the need to continue balancing the interests of airports, airlines, and other aeronautical users, neighboring communities, and the traveling public, among others. The 2018 Act devoted considerable attention to the FAA's continued work on the integration of UAS into the national airspace system. Key to this integration will be the ability to remotely identify a UAS and link it to its operator, a capability that is fundamental to the safety and security of UAS operations. A notice of proposed rulemaking on this subject is presently in executive branch clearance. Recognizing the capabilities of commercial UAS operations to carry cargo, Congress required that the FAA update existing regulations to allow for the practice. The FAA and industry have been demonstrating increasingly complex operations in this area as part of the UAS integration pilot program. We're using exemptions and waivers in the interim to meet the intent of the mandate while gaining the experience necessary to change the rules. The commercial space industry is booming, with an increasing number of launches and re-entries every year. Congress, recognizing the growing importance of this industry, required that the FAA stand up an Office of Spaceports within the FAA's Office of Commercial Space Transportation. And I'm pleased to say the Office of Spaceports is up and running, and we're actively working with spaceport licensees and stakeholders. In conclusion, 
I want to assure you that we're fully committed to carrying out the reauthorization provisions as quickly as possible while making sure we do not sacrifice the substance behind each requirement in a rush to declare completion. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elwell. I now turn to um, Joel Jabot for five minutes. You're recognized. Chairman Larson, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Members Graves, Members of the Subcommittee, thank you and Congress for passing the 2018 FAA reauthorization last fall and for inviting me to testify on behalf of the Department of Transportation. I also thank the committee for allowing Ms. Blaine Workey to join us. She is our Assistant General Counsel for the Department's Office of Aviation Enforcement and Proceedings, and thanks to provision in the reauthorization, our new aviation consumer advocate. The more than 550 sections of the Act cover a wide range of aviation issues, many supporting Secretary Chow's and this committee's first priority of safety and the Department's mission to ensure the safest and most efficient airspace in the world. Despite the government shutdown last winter and our daily operational safety priorities within the Department, we have made great progress on the safety, civil rights, and consumer protection provisions of the Act. The reauthorization includes more than 360 deliverables for the Department of Transportation, as Ranking Member Graves noted, including those assigned to the FAA. We are not able to tackle every deliverable simultaneously or produce all the required reports and regulations within the first year. We remain committed to accomplishing all of the provisions of the reauthorization as quickly as practical. We have already responded to key reauthorization requirements by establishing new offices to deal with important issues such as offices providing oversight of the organization designation of authorization and relating to consumer advocacy and support of our nation's spaceports. In other cases, provisions of the law provide useful guidance and authority to ensure that our grant programs are more accessible and that innovative programs, such as the Integrated Pilot Program for Unmanned Aircraft Systems, or UAS, can continue and expand. On the safe transportation of lithium batteries, the FAA and the Pipelines and Hazardous Materials Safety Administration have already coordinated to match our rules with international standards and allow lithium battery carriage exceptions for medical devices. They have established groups to provide research, evaluation, and safety recommendations on the issue. The reauthorization bolstered our efforts to maintain the world's safest airspace through the formation of several new advisory bodies and mechanisms to ensure safety. In addition to calling for reviews of the certification process for the Boeing 737 MAX, the Secretary and Administrator have also created groups, such as the Safety Oversight and Certification Advisory Committee, to augment the work of multiple ongoing inquiries. Within one month, DOT reconstituted the Aviation Consumer Protection Advisory Committee and established the National In-Flight Sexual Misconduct Task Force. We are determined to address the problem of in-flight sexual misconduct to enable a safe flight in every sense of the word. To ensure more accessible air service, we will develop the Airline Passengers with Disabilities Bill of Rights. We will review with input from stakeholders and, if necessary, revise regulations to ensure that passengers with disabilities receive dignified, timely, and effective assistance from trained personnel. We will also ensure regular training occurs for personnel charged with providing physical assistance to those passengers with disabilities. We have also issued notices and solicited applications for the Air Ambulance and Patient Billing Advisory Committee and the Air Carrier Access Act Advisory Committee. Both committees are established now. We will announce meeting dates after coordination with the committee members. We have taken steps to advance each of the 33 required rulemakings uh, that De Deputy Administrator Elwell mentioned from the Act. We expect to publish recommendations harmonizing the carriage of dangerous goods, including lithium batteries, and providing for remote identification of UAS, a critical step in enabling advanced operations. Other planned regulations will ensure that we are being responsive to the flying public. The upcoming rulemaking agenda for the fall will include seven rules focused on improving customer experience with airlines. These proposed rules will advance requirements for limiting cell phone usage on aircraft, ensure the public receives refunds for denied or unprovided service, and clarify the rights of passengers. While we have not yet completed all our obligations under the reauthorization, we have demonstrated our commitment to meeting them, and we have the right principles in place to accomplish the work. On behalf of the Secretary, I commit to continue our work to achieve a safe, accessible, accessible vision 
for, for aviation. I'm happy to join the Deputy Administrator, Dan Elwell, and our staff to answer any further questions you may have. Thank you. <clears throat> I recognize myself for five minutes, and I, I think the committee members uh, appreciate both of you saying that FAA and DOT are com remain committed to completing uh, the mandates uh, that we put into the uh, bill. I also think I convey the frustration that you haven't moved fast enough. For instance, on the 10-hour on the rest rule, we were very specific about what we wanted to see and how we wanted to see it and when we wanted to see it. Uh, I guess we thought that we didn't leave a lot of ambiguity in the uh, law about what we wanted and yet here we are in uh, September still waiting on a 10-hour rest rule. So uh, can either of you address what has been the delay specifically to implementing a 10-hour rest? Uh, yes, Chairman Larson, thank you for that question. Um, I'll start, we will implement um, that rule and, and that uh, provision consistent with the law. And you, I believe, mentioned it, or Chairman DeFazio, I think you mentioned that we are in the process of uh, processing the fatigue risk management plans. There are 48 airlines in the country that have flight attendants. We've received 28 uh, fatigue risk management plans to date. 10 have been approved. Um, and, and these are plans that are designed to meet, meet the requirement. Um, and you, it was not ambiguous language, sir, um, but, but what we weren't um, cleared from doing is normal uh, Administration Procedures Act uh, requirements. We have to do notice and comment for a rule like this. We have to do benefit cost analysis, and that entails rulemaking. Um, so uh, as we said, the ANPRM uh, has been dropped at, at yesterday, I believe. Um, Sir, uh, you and, and Chairman DeFazio, we commit that those comments that come from the ANPRM uh, will inform and actually uh, should, uh, my, my hope is, should accelerate the eventual uh, passage of the rule because the writing of the NPRM will be informed by those initial comments um, and, and I think lead to uh, a better written rule and hopefully expedition. But we have every intention of, of, uh, of getting that done, sir. I'm sure others will have a follow-up questions on that. I want to ask Mr. Debat, um, uh, what your timeline is for establishing uh, the uh, disabilities, uh, the Bill of Rights for travelers with disabilities? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the, uh, uh, for the question. As I mentioned in my testimony, uh, uh, we are committed um, to fulfilling the re re uh, requirements of establishing um, a, a, a Passengers with Disabilities Bill of Rights. Um, we have established the Air Carrier Access Act Advisory Committee, and one of our very first steps, the first charges to that committee, um, is uh, for them to take a look at the requirements that are set in statute uh, for developing uh, such a Bill of Rights and to make recommendations back to us. So if you will, the first step is we've established the committee uh, to look at this. Um, they will make recommendations back to us, and then our obligation is to look at those recommendations and implement them as quickly as possible uh, for the Passenger Bill of Rights. On the next panel, we'll have the President of the Paralyzed Veterans of America, and <clears throat> so uh, just pre prepping uh, the, the PVA to help us uh, give us some guidance on how we can give you guidance um, to move forward more quickly. Also, uh, with Regards to the workforce, uh, the, the workforce development title, I assume that's in, under your jurisdiction as well, Mr. Uh, Shabbat. Yeah. Um, so the law directed the FAA to establish a Women in Aviation Advisory Board to get moving on youth access to American Jobs and Aviation Task Force. Uh, it does not look, it does not seem that the DOT has moved forward on those aspects of the workforce development. Uh, do you have ideas uh, for timelines on those? Uh, uh, thank you again for the question, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, as with you, uh, the importance of first developing a strong workforce, uh, or recognizing the shortfalls in the workforce, uh, and one of the key uh, possible ways to address that, um, and just good on its own merits, by bringing more women uh, into the uh, 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 aviation workforce are high priorities for us. Um, as it happens, uh, within the last few days, the paperwork for the uh, Women in Aviation Task Force across my desk 
Uh, uh, we can expect to see an announcement that that task force has been formed uh, within days, uh, uh, not weeks. How, how many more desks does it have to cross then for it to become a reality? Um, in this case, I think it's crossed the last desk, uh, but until it's announced, I don't want to make any uh, commitments except to say it will be out within days, uh, not weeks. All right. Mr. Elwell, do you have a follow-up on the, anything there? Sir, workforce is a, a very big priority to us as it is to the department. Um, we are working apace on, uh, on 631 on the workforce grants. Um, um, there's some uh, technical difficulties on getting that uh, uh, processed and getting it forward. We also um, have a huge emphasis on STEM, uh, aviation and space education initiatives. Um, we've increased our um, employee engagement with young people by 200% in the past year, and that's a program uh, voluntarily uh, FAA uh, folks reach out to, to young people um, for uh, getting into this industry. It's, 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 a, it's a difficult challenge because uh, STEM, there's a shortage of STEM graduates across all sectors, but uh, so we're competing with other sectors on, on a, on a a shortage of these graduates, um, but we're we're trying to get them early. We're we're talking to them in elementary school. Yeah, okay. So I'll have my staff follow up with you rather than ask a question uh, about how we can help you get through these technical difficulties on the grants and uh, conclude and uh, recognize uh, Ranking Member Graves of Louisiana for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Elwell, you and I have discussed that. that, that number of occasions, uh, my, my frustration with uh, scenarios where Congress implements a law and only to have an agency either come back and not follow it or, or uh, invent their own interpretation that wasn't consistent with congressional intent. Uh, and, and when deadlines are in the law and those deadlines aren't adhered to, it, it does cause a great bit of frustration. Now, I know there were some anomalies with the FAA bill in that uh, the, the conference negotiations between the House and the Senate were, were very, uh, very quick. I know that there was some feedback uh, expressed by, by the agency about the inability to meet certain deadlines without some expedited procedures, including potentially waiving the APA in some, some scenarios. But I, I do want to reemphasize um, that, that adhering to these deadlines is, is important. We want to make sure that we continue to work together to um, ensure that, that, that we comply with many of these, including, as, uh, as the chairman mentioned, uh, the, the flight, attendant, flight attendant rule. Although I know, as I recall, and I'm sure we can get an update later, um, I believe a number of the contracts that have been implemented between airlines and the flight attendants do include the, the 10 hours. Um, you, you mentioned in your testimony remote ID. Uh, can you give a, a bit more uh, verbose update on, on remote ID and what the administration can do to uh, expedite implementation. I, I think that this is one of the key areas, as you and I have discussed in the past, about the, the, the evolution of this technology and all the, I think, advances that it potentially brings to different sectors, uh, including safety, disaster response, and many, many others. Um, could you talk a little bit about uh, efforts to expedite? Um, yes, Mr. Graves, thank you for the question. Um, uh, and I was remiss earlier when I started um, to not introduce uh, the lady to my right, Ms. Lirio Liu, is the resident expert at the FAA on all things um, rulemaking. Um, she's the acting deputy of the, uh, the Office of Safety, but um, I expect I will be uh, leaning to her a few times during this hearing today, um, particularly on this, perhaps, uh, Lirio can weigh in. Um, First, let me say, sir, I share your frustration. I hate to miss deadlines. Um, and, uh, but I won't, and, and as the agency, we won't um, make a deadline and compromise, of course. Safety, you wouldn't want us to. We're not gonna do it. And not all deadlines are missed because, uh, because of that, but uh, you're right. In, the, in, in this case, there's just a, a volume of, um, of first year requirements that uh, in, in light of other things going on in the past year, um, the, the deadline slipped. On the remote ID, um, I too share your uh, points that it is the foundational rule upon which everything else we do with, with UAS is going to flow. Um, and we need, we need to get it out. We had uh, a lot of issues, a lot of technical issues. 
um, with it at the beginning. Um, a lot of it was interagency, quite frankly, um, law enforcement uh, requirements and issues and Title 18 requirements um, and the like. Uh, it, and we are very appreciative of Chairman DeFazio changing the, um, uh, the provision on recreational uh, modelers. Um, however, that caused us to basically start almost from scratch on writing the provision. So there's been uh, uh, a number of things, um, but nevertheless, the, the, uh, uh, the rule is, is moving. Um, we're gonna get it done, and uh, I would, Turn to uh, Ms. Liu if there's anything um, on, on the actual technical writing side of it that you wanted to add. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mr. Obel. Get a little close. Um, yes, on the remote ID, it has actually been one of the priorities for the organization uh, for quite a long period of time. I think you've heard that within the FAA at many other testimonies that have been presented here, that it's sort of the linchpin for integrating the U.S. in the future. The rule never stopped. From the time we started to work on it, and I think as Dr. Uh, Mr. L indicated, we had drafted a rule and was very close to finalizing it, but it had a lot of carve-outs as it relates to the Section 336 of the previous reauthorization that um, counted for recreational users. Um, because of that limitation, we had to consider how we would actually do identification in various scenarios, so that was one reason why when we got the provision now to include them, which we consider a great benefit, um, we did have to go back and rewrite the rule. But it's to a benefit to us, and I think that we'll end up with a much better um, regulatory framework in the end. The rule currently is over at OIRA, which is the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs, and OMB. Um, we expect that they will be expediting that review as well, because I think they recognize the significant. We've already done an in-brief with them just last Friday, as well as with the, uh, the technical officer for the United States uh, at the Office of Management and Budget there. So uh, it was seemed to be well received. But I'm sorry. Could you move that mic a little closer to you? Yeah, Pardon I'm me. having trouble hearing. It's me. It's not you. Thank you. No. Well, I probably have the same. Um, but we have already had an in brief with the re review the rule, um, and it is as as, as Mr. L indicated. It is um, a technical rule because it will set the basis for how we will do uh, what we do equivalently for for manned aircraft as ADSB, and it's going to also set the framework for our UTM in the future, which is a UAS traffic air traffic management system. And I think what's important is even if the rule is not in place, what we're trying to do um, through a number of other aspects is to increase uh, the compliance and, and expedite that. Um, I think another thing that's important is that this is going to be a unique rule, and I think it's pretty innovative on our part because it's going to be a, a partnership similar to what we do with the um, notification right now to get authorization to fly UAS. So we use uh, the public in interest um, through a website. Um, I think that we have, yeah, I think that we actually have a, a good framework in place. Uh, there was an RFI request for information that went out and it outlined the provisions so that the uh, remote ID um, standards can be put out forward so they can be starting to design towards that. And I feel that uh, for what we, even though there's a delay in the rulemaking, there, there is very good progress being made to support the remote identification. Uh, thank you case. very much. Um, uh, Mr. Elwell, I, I do, I'm going to submit questions for the record regarding Section 506, 509, 549 regarding cybersecurity and Mr. Sabat. Also want to, little, want, to, want to learn a little bit more about uh, the status of emotional support animals and, and uh, what DOTD is doing there. So I'll be submitting some questions on that as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Before I uh, recognize uh, Mr. DePazio for five minutes, just the next three on the, uh, after Mr. DeFazio, the next three on the Republican side will be Webster, Mitchell, and Gallagher, and the next three on the Democratic side will be, uh, after DeFazio, will be Lipinski, Cohen, and Davids in that order. So just a heads up for folks. Uh, Chair DeFazio for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Elwell, uh, can you assure me that uh, the uh, Congress said irreducible 10-hour break? That's not going to change, right? No matter what's going on in this rulemaking or whatever. You can't, I mean, if, that, if we're that explicit, even if airlines complain it's going to cost them a bunch of money or whatever, you can't reduce that. Would that be correct? That's a statute. Sir, and, and I can commit that um, under the confines of the, of the reviews that it has to go through and the other agencies mm -hmm. that have to weigh in, um, that that is the intent, is to meet well, your... You Right, you can't meet your rule and to I, meet the language. I had a language. lengthy hearing with GSA yesterday where, you know, the law isn't the law. I just want to make sure in this case the law is the law. It says 10 hours. It's very explicit. So, um, but here's, here's the other side. I understand, uh, you know, uh, and I, 
you know, perhaps in the future when we have to do these sorts of things, we will anticipate and obviate somehow the rulemaking process. But you're also, uh, the air carriers, Part 121, were supposed to submit for, you know, fatigue risk management plans no later than 90 days. Now, they don't have to go through a rulemaking, they just have to send you a plan. What's the holdup with, you said you've only got 11 who've completed this? Well, sir, we have 28 submitted, um, yep. and uh, as far as their meeting that 90 days, um, we are talking to them uh, along the way. Um, Is there a possibility of fining them if they're not in compliance with that? I'll have to get back to you on the enforcement side of it. Um, I don't. I don't have that right in front right. of me. I mean, uh, we're we're pretty explicit, and it really shouldn't take more than 90 days. I was just informed that you know uh, that United had theirs in at the first in January, so um, I, I don't want this to you know it's some low common denominator out there dragging this out unnecessarily. Uh, and then on the uh, the secondary uh, barriers, uh, we asked that an order be issued. Uh, essentially, it would be like a corrective action having to do with something to do with the structure of the plane or whatever, an order. Um, and, but now we're going to go through a rulemaking or an advisory committee on secondary barriers. What would happen if you just ordered the airlines to do it? Uh, Mr. Chairman, even an order would, would require rulemaking unless it was an emergency order and the... Uh, well, it could be an emergency order. We don't want to have another 9-11. Mm -hmm. Well, sir, that, that uh, uh, the process still requires rulemaking. Uh, making changes to the interior of a 121 uh, aircraft is an STC, a supplementary type certificate. Mm -hmm. uh, that requires uh, approval from... from from uh, the FAA. The FAA has to provide for all the carriers the standards and the performance requirements for mm -hmm. the barrier, which again would normally entail rulemaking. And we have to think about these barriers have to cover everything from a 50 seat regional jet to a, a twin aisle uh, international carrier. And, and so there are serious things to consider both uh, on safety, on um, uh, the, the manufacture of these doors, what okay, kind but, of doors. All right, that's good. I, I get that. But you, you um, do agree with what the law says. There's no question that the former chairman was incorrect in saying we meant new types, that we said all newly manufactured aircraft. New production aircraft, yes, yep. sir. Okay, that's good. Um, and then, um, you know, the uh, UAS rule at OMB, uh, I, I'm perhaps Ms. Lou can answer. Uh, you know, the trolls at OMB, uh, you know, delay a lot of necessary things. This is a critical rule. Uh, how are they going to calculate their cost benefit when we don't even know, we haven't done a test yet on ingesting a drone. We don't know if it's going to cause, you know, uncontained failure and uh, take the plane down or whatever. I mean, what, what are they using? I mean, what, what are the costs that are involved? There are no costs to the, to the government. I don't think we can address directly the ingestion for an aircraft um, engine uh, of a UAS, but the intent of the mode ID is to actually allow for us to detect before you would actually have that encounter. Right. Um, so uh, there's benefits because of what we have seen already in dispenses um, of resources to do the tracking for UAS. Um, and I think it's more the benefit that we can find in uh, allowing the new industry to operate in a safer manner than what we have been using in some cases, manned aircraft. Right, so, but I, I just don't know what OMB is dithering over. I, I, for instance, last summer we had a bad fire summer. I had uh, planes, a whole uh, you know, fleet of planes and helicopters taken down because some jerk was taking photographs of the fire and there was a drone in the restricted airspace. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know how anybody can't find that there is a huge benefit. We've shut down airports when we have drones in the airport. I mean, there's no downside to this, correct? And actually, those are accounted for in, in the cost-benefit analysis. Okay. Thank you. My time's expired. Thank you. Recognize uh, Mr. Webster for five minutes. Sometimes I hate government. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to uh, discuss an issue concerning the registration of a, an aircraft uh, where constituent of mine has gone through kind of a nightmare experience, nightmare experience uh, in trying to get a, his aircraft 
which he purchased uh, from the U.S. Marshals auction, and it was owned by a member of the drug cartel in Mexico. Mexico. So he tried to get it uh, registered here. The FAA told him it's still registered in Mexico. You're going to have to fix that. He tried to get that done. Uh, matter of fact, you aided him in, in trying to do that, but the Mexican authorities just uh, basically answered politely. Uh, your, your request is warmly received, but they've done nothing. And this, there is no dispute over ownership or anything like that. Uh, so the Mexican authorities, I think, are operating in bad faith. I mean, he hired a lawyer in Mexico. They told him uh, that give me $150,000 and we'll get your plane registered for you which is a little steep. It's plain and simple extortion, something. I don't know, whatever you want to call it. So uh, the particular case um, kind of sheds light on a glowing flaw in U.S. policy because it's questioning the sovereignty of this country. Uh, in a sense, uh, there's clearly a negative impact on citizens if um, a foreign government could uh, stop a uh, the United States or a citizen here of getting an aircraft uh, um, registered. It's like uh, some kind of hostage. So anyway, I, I guess my question is, what, what would, what's the next step if the Mexican government continues to refuse to give him uh, or to deregister de the plane in Mexico? Well, sir, <clears throat> um, I've been apprised of this situation and um, it's sort of a, a new area for me, and my understanding is that there are uh, international agreements that don't permit us to register an aircraft that has a foreign registry. And in the past, um, this has been sort of a, a, a very quick thing done between State Departments uh, and, and uh, uh, the, in the ICAO agreement is met because um, our State Department calls their State Department and the, the government uh, in question says, yes, we released the registration, go ahead. And for some reason, in this case, as you rightly described, government of Mexico is not uh, doing what uh, they normally do. So um, we are uh, looking into it. We are talking to DOJ. We're talking to State Department. Um, and the intent is, is to get this resolved, sir. So you're committed to going to the highest level and, uh, with the Mexican authorities uh, to, to try to get this squared away? Yes, sir. We're, we'll, we'll do everything we can under the current agreements and law. and. Uh, to get to the bottom of this so that your constituent can register the airplane. Okay, thank you very much. I, Mr. Chairman, I have a, uh, a um, I'd like to ask unanimous consent for the insertion of a, a, a letter that goes to the issue that several have talked about, and that's the, uh, the unmanned vehicle. Uh, so if I could do that, that would be great. Without objection. Um, I also have uh, sort of an issue there too, just you brought it up, so there's, uh, and others did. I'm a district where there are parks, theme parks, bunches of them, big ones. They're worlds in some cases. And uh, so I, I, there is real concern about that in that area too and, and how they're going to be able to proceed, especially even some of the smaller parks really have, have more concern, uh, how they're going to proceed in getting some sort of um, uh, 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 ability to stop uh, UAS uh, activity in proximity to their park. So I just throw that in to say I'm, I'm in on whatever we can do to get speed that up. I know twice it was in one of uh, our reauthorization bills. And uh, anyway, it'd be good to get on it. Yield back. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lipinski is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I've been a lot of talk about the uh, delays in rulemaking. Uh, the reason why it's important is we have to be concerned about delays because we're talking about first and foremost safety. And I know uh, Chairman DeFazio uh, and others have talked about the secondary cockpit barrier, the 10 hour rest rule for flight attendants. And so a delay in rulemaking is a delay uh, in, in safety. You also have quality of life issues that we're, we're talking about here, both for people who fly and those who live uh, around airports. And I'm gonna have a question about that. And you also have um, delays in technology, uh, which hurt the, uh, I think hurt the United States. And um, 
it, uh, the remote ID uh, rule has to do with safety first and foremost, but it also has to do with the uh, advancement of, uh, of UAS, and uh, that uh, is impacts, uh, impacts jobs in, in this country. Uh, we want to be the leader in, in innovation in, in all areas. I want to start out asking, um, you know, on the technology side, uh, I include a provision in the FAA a reauthorization, sex, section 192, uh, for uh, R&D demonstration projects for zero emission uh, technology. And I wanted to ask what the FAA has been doing to, uh, to implement this program. This is a um, advanced technology, zero emissions, obviously, uh, something important looking at the uh, protecting the, the environment. Uh, and uh, is there anything that, uh, Mr. Elwell, you can tell me about, about this? Well, Mr. Lipinski, I'm not um, immediately familiar with the uh, with the section, but I uh, that you're that you're asking about. I will certainly get back to you um, if if that's okay with in a detailed response. I will tell you <laughs> that innovation is a uh, major priority, and in, in for Secretary Chow, for the administration, and for us. Um, in fact, uh, uh, one initiative that we're we're trying to um, affect within the FAA is to create an office of innovation um, that, that whose charge would be to take in new technologies and assimilate them into our culture quicker than we currently do. Um, uh, technology today moves, as we all know, so much faster than it did a few decades ago, and. The FAA and aviation were slow to begin with, um, as, as you point out, because of our safety concerns. But anything that we can do to, on the R&D side or on the operational testing side, anything we can do to accelerate innovation, especially as fast as it's moving, I, all, I look, I'm all for that, sir. Right, I look forward to hearing about uh, Section 192, what you're doing, and also uh, what you're talking about in terms of, of innovation and what we can do to be helpful on, on that. Uh, I wanted to move on to a, a quality of life issue. I have Midway Airport in my district, which everyone loves Midway Airport for the economic engine that it is, but uh, uh, everyone hates the noise, obviously. And this is a one square mile airport that has house, houses on all four sides. So uh, section 188 uh, required a report on the day night average sound level, the DNL. Uh, so when can we expect the, uh, the report to be completed on, on that? Well, sir, the um, <clears throat> section asking for a report on, on D&L, um, I don't, I'm not sure I can give you a, a date on the completion of that report. Um, well, I I, I'll have to get, get back to you on that. Getting sir. back to me on that, yeah. I, was, I was wondering if uh, there's, you know, any expectation that the, uh, you know, it's currently at 65 decibels. If it could be uh, maybe lowered uh, after this comes out, yeah. lo report comes out. Sir, um, actually, um, we're going to get that DNL report out by before the end of the year. Okay. Thank you. It's it's been a, an issue with. Uh, Next gen and new technology, uh, there has been uh, increases in uh, noise levels uh, in, in certain areas around airports, and this is something that uh, uh, I'd like to talk more with you about, and we need to continue to work because this has been a, uh, a major issue for many people who live um, uh, not just around Midway Airport, my district, O'Hare, just outside my district and across the country. So. Thank you. I'll yield back. Recognize uh, Mr. Mitchell of Michigan for five minutes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> the FAA Reauthorization Act contained, as we've already discussed, numerous mandates and expectations for the FAA for implementation of changes. One of the biggest challenges we had in the reauthorization was the discussion around next gen, how it should be structured, moving it forward. It's no secret air traffic control system is, it has anti uses antiquated equipment, some procedures as a result and needed improvement. How we got there was a, a significant discussion. We came to a bipartisan agreement 
Over the past 30, over the past years, we've spent billions of dollars, countless hours. We recently had an update on NextGen, uh, which was really helpful. We don't have to rehash the details of how we got here, but we, I do want to talk about one provision. In the bill, we included Section uh, 547, the Enhanced Air Traffic Services provision. The amendment to describe briefly required a creation of a pilot program to demonstrate the full promise of next-gen technologies, to designate certain airports, to provide limited access for planes that have full next-gen technology, and to demonstrate the, the benefits and the cost savings as a result of that, and the safety improvements, to be honest with you. A uh, report to come back to Congress. Uh, there was a time frame out of 90 days. Uh, we talked a little bit before the hearing. I'd like to get an update. I think we'd all like an update of where we're at on that pilot program and how, when we expect that to move forward. Well, thank you for that question, Mr. Mitchell. Um, and uh, this is a, a project that uh, we have a lot of energy behind, and three airports to do enhanced air traffic system uh, testing. I believe it's for three-hour blocks, continuous three-hour blocks in the day. Um, and the Next Gen Advisory Committee, who's, who's been tasked, uh, and as you know, that is the committee of all the stakeholders in, in, in invested in Next Gen. Um, to give us their recommendations, and they have uh, promised us the, the airports uh, recommended by spring of 2020, and then we will do a two-year pilot program uh, on the enhanced air traffic services from 21 to 23. So we don't expect any further progress until, any definitive progress until spring of 2020? Yes, sir, and 2020 is when we'll have the airports named. Will it be at three airports or five? Do you have an idea? Because we look current. We require three. You were talking maybe more. Is there? Is there? A, a, so it's currently three. Um, right. But sir, mm -hmm. I, I will take that uh, back to the NAC, and we'll look at the possibility of increasing that because I think it's a very uh, valid and worthwhile program um, to be able to look at what full equipage. To your point, full equipage. What will it do to efficiency at at, at any airport? Well, and I think that in your report, I would ask that not just efficiency, but also in terms of its impact on safety. Right. Because your ability to, to route aircraft and, and separations and all those are far more accurately when you're using that type of system. So that, you know, that, that report would be helpful and important as we move forward. Yes, so sir. I encourage implementation of that as timely as we can. Let me change gears a little bit. I share um, Chairman DeFazio's concerns about evacuation. The uh, reauthorization contained a couple of mandates that I think are important. Establishing minimum dimensions for passenger seats on air, tra air carriers. Um, I would surprise you to know I'm not exactly a dainty guy. I want you to look around the room. Uh, there's a lot of not so dainty people. Uh, seat size, dimensions between seats, exits. Uh, I'm not sure that the models that are being used, to be honest with you, really reflect current air travelers. It's certainly not in the United States, North America. Uh, at 6'2 two and 240 pounds or so, uh, you know, uh, uh, where are we at in terms of moving forward? Because we mandated establishing minimum dimensions for passenger seats, evaluating the, the evacuation procedures and time. Um, that could become pretty critical. Can you advise us how, how we move forward on that? Because besides whether or not I cram my, my backside in a seat, uh, getting out would be a really useful thing. So could you update us? Yes, sir. Thank you for that question, Mr. Mitchell. Um, we uh, are looking at the language. Um, we're thankful that Mr. Cohen's provision um, asked us to look at seat size and seat pitch and seat dimensions, in obviously in the in the construct of safety, which is 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 what our uh, mandate is. Um, we are going to perform testing in this uh, for this section, including human testing, and later this year. Um, we're going to establish the necessary seat pitch width length based on safety, uh, which would be the basis for any rulemaking if, if we need Let me stop if I can because he's going to hit the gavel in a minute. Uh, do we have a time frame on when you're going to do that testing and we're going to get some feedback? Yeah, Lirio, do you have an update on the timing of it? Pardon me. No, I understand it's supposed to occur before the end of the year. Uh, we've set up the Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee as well. Um, an a a ray rack that's also going to look at the evacuation study. So taking all that data in, we'll be able to determine the appropriate size and, and of the rule. I'll just add, we have um, 12 days of testing planned in November with 720 live bodies and a collection of 3,000 data points. He likes that gavel, but that's I heard the gavel. Thanks very much. I, I do you back, sir. You were doing so well, Mr. Mitchell. Mr. Cohen, for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And first, Mr. Mitchell, I appreciate your questioning. And um, I will rue your absence from the Congress because you were, have been such a good member, but I understand your logic and I co commend you on it. Uh, in the last Congress, we passed the FAA Reauthorization Act and I sponsored, as Director Ewell has mentioned, with, along with Representative Adam Kinzinger, the SEED Act, which mandated that you provide us within a year for safety purposes, pitch with the whole rigmarole with seats. And yet we don't have it. Uh, tests in the past have been done with computers, and I think they're computers, if I'm not totally incorrect, I think they were provided by the airline or the manufacturer, and they were simulations provided by them. We don't need to have another crisis like we had with the Boeing airplane, that we have a crash and we come back and we have to ask the FAA, people couldn't get out of the plane in 90 seconds, why did you not comply with the SEED Act? So tell me again why this hasn't been accomplished. We're almost a year. And if it's going to be human conditions to where you've got people, Mr. Mitchell's size, Mr. DeFazio's size, Mr. Trump's size, all in coach class, trying to get out of a plane in 90 seconds. Are you going to have those people? Oh, sir, we are. Um, we're looking at it. Um, obviously, as Chairman DeFazio said, that uh, Americans are um, getting bigger. And uh, so seat size is, is important. But it's got to be looked at in the context of safety, and that requires testing. And answer uh, Chairman DeFazio's earlier question, the most recent live full air evacuation testing was actually done in 2018. Uh, not 20 years ago, it was, it was the Airbus 350. So we, we've done it. Um, and despite uh, what- When you did what, this test with the Airbus, it, it, this, was that done here or in Europe? Uh, I'm not, it was done in Europe, he also did it. Uh, our yeah, most- why, have, ha, why has not the FAA done it in America with Americans? We're widening out more than Europeans. Yeah. They're doing vegan free and multigrain and eating fruit. We aren't. Sir, we did the uh, 787 were the most recent uh, times we've done live testing. Um, and as I said, we're lined up to do 12 days of evacuation testing in November. With 720 people, we're going to collect 3,000 data points. But one thing I want to I, I want to allay your concerns a little bit. Um, in the most recent examples of full whole loss uh, accidents, 100% evacuation. Um, Within 90 Asiana, seconds? Asiana in, Asiana in, uh, in San Francisco, Aeromexico, Mexico. Were they um, done within 90 seconds? I, 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 can't, I, I can't tell. I can get back to you on whether it happened in 90 seconds. But, but survivability today is much, much better uh, due to a lot of great work that we do at the Tech Center in New Jersey and, and uh, great improvements in, in flammability and survivability. Uh, but you're right. We need to do testing on evacuation. We're going to do live testing, and we're going to get you an answer on the seat pitch as it pertains to safety, sir. And where are you going to get these people? You're not going to go to uh, SlimFast, are you? Sir, we, we're going to try to use a, a good demographic sampling, and we'll maybe invite you. Um, I, I, it would be uh, good to invite me because I've got a bad leg. And you've got people in this country who are larger, but you've also got people with disabilities who yes, fly. Sir. Yes, sir. And you need to have a representative sample, and you've got, you know, children and whatever. Oh, so we, we, we do incorporate all, the, all of those things, lap children, um, uh, animals. We, we incorporate all of that, and we will in the testing. Um, uh, and, and, and I don't know, Lirio, if there's anything I've missed on how we do that testing. Um, I can reflect back on that from my certification days. Yes, in fact, when we simulate the test during certification, we'll actually block half the exits. It'll also be in a dark uh, environment. Um, the attendants that are on the evacuation test don't know which exits are blocked to simulate a, a live situation. The demographics are typically volunteers from anyone, so there is no specific demographic that's shot, sought for. 
So as you'll see, it'll also be dark in the cabin. So they try to simulate the worst case scenario. Thank you. If you would invite me, I'd love to be at least an observer. And if you pick Democrats, you'll get a good representative demographic of America. Mr. Gallagher is recognized for five minutes. <laughs> I have much less exciting, uh, dare I say dainty questions uh, to offer. But uh, Northeast Wisconsin Technical College, which is located in uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, is concerned about the implementation of Section 631, a program known as the Community and Technical College Centers of Excellence in Small Unmanned Aircraft Systems Technology Training. So this program was intended to help community colleges like NWTC ex uh, extend their role in education and training for small drone technology. It seems like a good idea. Uh, but Northeast Wisconsin Technical College reports there hasn't been much progress made to implement this program, even though it was created with the deadline of 180 days after the enactment, which should have been April 5th, 2019, if my math is correct. So I would ask, uh, what is the current status of establishing a process to designate community colleges uh, UAS centers of excellence? Thank you for that question, Mr. Gallagher. Um, we did briefly mention 631 a little bit earlier. One of the issues is that the way this provision was presented, it was with centers of excellence, which are not grant programs, are not grant recipient programs. Um, so we're working through that, and, and I told Chairman Larson we will um, uh, uh, work through um, the wording issues so that we can get this done. I'm a huge proponent. I was recently up at Vaughn College, which is a CTI uh, college for, um, for controllers, uh, and had a wonderful conversation with a student, um, a young lady who is a dynamo aviation enthusiast and is going to graduate in the spring with $86,000 in debt. So, um, you know, if we're going to excite young people into this profession, um, both uh, for government service and in industry, we have to get a handle on this and we've got to get them trained. And I agree with you 100%. I know that Section 632, which is related, um, it, we hope to have that done by the end of the year, and it's going to certainly help community colleges uh, specialize. Um, so we understand the need, sir, and I hate to, to talk about technicalities, but uh, we're going to work through them. Well, we often find ourselves dealing with technicalities here. Can you give us a flavor, and I don't know if it's who, which one of you two would address, just kind of what the, the consultation uh, that has taken place between FAA, Department of Transportation, Education, Labor, all the other interagency uh, players in this on 631? Or perhaps more broadly, do you feel like there is interagency buy-in to the, the, the program? So I'm, I'm not aware of an interagency discussion on 631. Um, and so, uh, and I'm not sure it's required um, if it's a program that we can uh, implement and do. I'm just advised um, from from the um, the language is 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 been a problem. And and uh, uh, but I, I certainly will get to interagency discussion if, if we have to do it, and we'll, we'll use it. I know that, you know, last year around this time, we had a workforce summit at National Airport where we did have all the, we had the Air Force Secretary, we had Secretary Chow, we had Department of Labor, Department of Education, um, all coming together to come up with solutions on these workforce issues. So we're, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a high priority of ours, and, and uh we will get back to you on the work. Um, and, and if there's anything that you can do, we we'll certainly uh, won't be shy to ask uh, how, sure. how you can help, sir. I really appreciate that and look forward to working with you. Final question. Um, so for these colleges, technical colleges, you know, college like Northeast Wisconsin Technical College who want to be forward leaning, they want to take full adva advantage of 631. I mean, what advice would you have for them right now? Well, first of all, I think getting the um, CTI accreditation, um, uh, two-year programs uh, will suffice for that. Uh, get, get recognized as a preferential. Uh, controllers do preferential hiring. Um, they, it's a separate pool if they come from a CTI school. I think that's an incentive unto itself. Um, and then the extent to which uh, a college can be um, eligible for uh, assistance federal assistance, that's, that's the issue that uh, we need to, to look into and get back to you on. 
I appreciate that. I, I think we have an opportunity here. I mean, there's a lot of bipartisan goodwill around the idea of elevating our technical, our vocational schools, and this would seem to be a growth industry and an industry that could attract the attention of a lot of um, millennials and whatever we're calling the generation that's younger than millennials these days. So appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Gallagher. Um, before I go to Representative Craig, just in order, we have on the Republican side, Balderson, Rouser, and Perry, and then on our side, Craig, Davids, Carbajal. Just to get people prepared, so rec recognize Representative Craig for five minutes. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's absolutely clear, uh, clear that our communities uh, who are near our airports have benefited from the employment opportunities and convenient access to domestic and international travel. But those who live around those major airports also live with the burden of often overwhelming overhead noise, especially as the number of flights around the country continues to increase and their flight paths become more streamlined and precise. Where I live in Egan, Minnesota, we are severely impacted by aviation noise and the city's recently taken the opportunity to come up with some measures uh, to address and mitigate these issues, which I applaud. Although I wasn't in office for the passage of the 2018 FAA reauthorization, I'm encouraged by many of the provisions that address these noise concerns uh, and problems nationwide. Um, Mr. Elwell and Mr. Shabbat, I'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, on the status and intended outcomes of a few of those provisions, if you don't mind. Section 189 instructs the FAA to conduct a study on potential health and economic impact of overflight noise. You formally entered into a partnership for this research, uh, which is a great first step. Can you tell me a little bit more about the parameters of this study and how you're weighing the effects of noise on children and families uh, like our city in Egan? Thank you for that question, Ms. Craig. Um, we have entered into an agreement with MIT and Boston University uh, on the commencement of that study, and I can get back to you on the parameters and, uh, and what the, the agreed um, uh, parts of that study are uh, with, with MIT and Boston University. Um, Mr. Shabbat, anything to add to that? Madam Secretary, thank you for the question, but no. Thank you. So section 175 is titled Addressing Community Noise Concerns, and it effectively compels the FAA administrator to shift flight takeoff and landing patterns if an airport operator and community jointly make a reasonable and safe request to do so. The city of Egan is currently urging this consideration with the Metropolitan Airports Commission. As a member of Congress, how can I be supportive of my constituents during this process? What more can my constituents do uh, to raise their voices on issue related to noise concerns? Mr. Elwell? Well, uh, community engagement is critically important. Um, we understand that. We are uh, refining and improving our community engagement. Um, we have are naming uh, noise ombudsmen at all of our regional uh, administra all of our regional offices. Uh, those those noise ombudsmen will report directly to the regional administrators. Uh, in your case, I believe it would be Great Lakes, um, and uh, community engagement, uh, cross agency uh, engagement. Uh, led by the regional administrators and the ombudsman it is, is critically important. The goal, of course, is to engage, listen, as you said, and make adjustments as necessary. Um, and there's quite a few communities around the country um, where we're doing that. I, I would say just a couple of data points on noise that I found intriguing. Um, in 1970, there were 200 million passenger emplanements, and seven people, seven million people, subjected to significant noise o over the 65 DNL. Today, we carry 900 million emplanements, and 400,000 people are subjected to noise above 65 DNL. Um, we acknowledge this is, uh, uh, to, for your constituents and many others, a, a, a critical issue, and we're engaging it. But I, I will tell you that both in engine design, aircraft design, um, procedural design, 
uh, there's huge advances being made in, keep, in getting aviation quieter, uh, but there's more we can do, um, and we're, we're anxious to engage with the communities and all the stakeholders to see uh, how we can um, make uh, the air quieter above your constituents. Thank you so much. I um, appreciate the thoughtful answer you gave, and I hope you will uh, also uh, be given the opportunity to review the very thoughtful recommendations from the City of Egan. So thank you so much, and Mr. Chairman, I yield back my time. Thank you. Recognize uh, Rep Representative Balderson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and, and thank you, panelists, for, for being here this morning. Uh, Mr. Elwell, I'll, I'll direct my first question to you and just kind of follow up what uh, Mr. Gallagher was referring to with workforce development. That's something that's very important. But what is the FFA, FAA doing to improve the aviation workforce pipeline? I mean, what for the pilots, I know there's an extreme shortage for the pilots, projected that there's going to be 790,000 pilots short by 2037. So what, what are you all doing you know, for that pipeline? Thank you for that question, Mr. Balderson. Um, as I referenced the uh, Workforce Summit, uh, I think in the, the day-long summit we had maybe five different panels uh, that covered the gamut. Uh, we do anticipate a pilot shortage in, uh, in the coming decade, but it's not just pilots, it's, it's, it's all of the technical fields in, in our, uh, in our in our sector, it, it, and you know, it, it's not a mandate of the FAA to ensure a large pilot population, uh, but we do believe that a, um, a shrinking pilot uh, demographic is, is not good for the system and ultimately probably not good for, uh, for safety. So what we're doing is we're engaging. Uh, we have a workforce task group within the FAA. It's engaging um, uh, many different organizations, women in aviation, for instance, um, the Airline and, uh, uh, Owners and Pilot Association, AOPA, um, all of the sort of alphabet groups that represent interests in our sector, uh, the e e Air Force Junior ROTC, um, they came to the FAA and said, we're trying to do a program where we take kids uh, after their sophomore year in high school, uh, send them to a university, I think Auburn is one of them that they contracted with, uh, we take a kid coming out of 10th grade who doesn't even know what an airplane looks like, and by the end of the summer, they have their private pilot's license. Uh, but FAA, you have a restriction of 17 years old uh, to get a private pilot's license. Can you work with us to get it back to 16 so we can get those kids um, before they commit to some other profession? These are the kinds of uh, engagements we want to have. Um, it was mentioned already, women in aviation. Women are woefully underrepresented in our sector, and, and I, I think that's uh, a, a huge demographic and population uh, that we should be interest, you know, creating interest for, for this industry. Um, we have an MOU with the Air Force uh, to uh, look at their pilot training um, uh, research. They're making, um, doing some very, very interesting things in, in pilot training that we think can be mirrored in the civil sector. So um, uh, this is a huge initiative. Um, we're anxious for any and all uh, ideas and help that we can get because we, we know that this committee is, is uh, as, as passionate about this as we are and uh, we're, we're ready, willing, and able to engage on how we can improve the workforce um, the strength of the workforce. And, and, and Congressman, if I can just tag on for a minute in support of uh, Mr. Elwell's comments, this is something that matters to the department as a whole, uh, as well as the uh, uh, Federal Aviation Administration. Uh, Secretary Chow herself kicked off the Forces to Flyers initiative, um, so working with the Air Force elsewhere in the military to ensure the transition uh, for pilots, for other uh, qualified aviation personnel uh, to move to the uh, civilian sector. Um, uh, Dan has also mentioned uh, women in aviation. Uh, as part of that, uh, the department is working through the Department of State internationally, uh, APEC, uh, the Asian Pacific Economic Council. Uh, we're working for a, a women in aviation um, a, a, a prioritization uh, within all of the countries uh, that border on the Pacific. Sorry. Thank you. And, and I'll follow up, and, and both of you may answer this response or question also. Do you believe the FAA currently has the necessary resources uh, to take on the pilot 
and, and shortcomings. And I know that you say reaching out to us, but we, my office would love to communicate with you all of, of giving you leads or, or some way of not necessarily leads, but how you can we can make it, you know, so you can attract uh, young adults. And, and whether that's, uh, I have a very good friend of mine and his, his son is finishing his private uh, pilot's license right now. And, and he is, you are correct, right? I mean, he is 17 years old. Um, probably could have started flying earlier than that. Not much, but uh, we, we would love to work with you in, in, in some in ways to, to change that. So thank you both very much for your response. Thank I you, yield sir. back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Rep Rep uh, Representative Balderson. I recognize the vice chair of the subcommittee, Representative Davids of Kansas. Thank you, uh, Chairman, Ranking Member, and thank you to the witnesses for uh, coming here today. I appreciate your time and your expertise. Um, I wasn't here when we passed the reauthorization previously, so I'm hoping for just a little bit of insight. Uh, so my first question is for uh, Deputy Administrator Elwell, who I know you've been here before. Well, welcome back in your, in your new role. Um, there's been a troubling number of media reports um, about passengers and crews uh, being uh, falling ill or, or becoming sick because of cabin uh, fumes and, and air quality in the cabins. And I'm hoping to um, hear from you briefly about how the fumes and smoke might even make it into the plane for, for folks who don't already know that. Thank you for that uh, question, Ms. Davids. Um, we are working toward completing all the requirements uh, that's included, uh, engaging with, including engaging with uh, stakeholders on useful education materials. This is all uh, parts of what, what, what was in the bill. Um, useful education materials, uh, developing reporting guidance uh, for carriers, reminding carriers to use their SMS, their safety management system, to identify issues that's what SMS uh, is for, it's what it's all about, to identify issues and share with crew, their crew members and their technicians. And engaging, uh, we are engaging in the uh, research of bleed air. Um, uh, you know, when it, when it comes to cabin air um, issues, it, it, it often comes down to uh, the bleed air, what's coming in the cabin to pressurize the cabin from the outside. Um, and the refresh rate, you know, the, res the recirculation rate. So um, we are uh, uh, looking into it in, in all the areas that, uh, that, that, that the bill mandated. And I, I, if, if it's okay, i um, like to check with Lirio to see uh, if you can that expound would, on that. That would be great. Um, it is part of the certification requirements of the aircraft, but right now... You Oh, thank you. Um, I don't know that I have anything more to say on that. I think it is under research. Um, we have the appropriate working groups uh, starting the process uh, and using the data as was indicated by Deputy Administrator. And actually, that's a great um, point to hit a follow-up question I had, which is I know that there were a number of um, requirements in the reauthorization and commissioning a study was one of those one of those requirements and it seems as though that's been something that's been delayed so I'm curious if you could give a little bit of uh, maybe a progress update on what the what kind of research you've been able to do into uh, if I have the language correct it's to assess the potential health effects of the contaminants from bleed air which you mentioned and um, yeah, any other, any other updates you might have around that? Yes, ma'am, we have um, begun, begun that process, begun that, that research and that testing. Um, and, and I remember reading through it, but I will have to get back to you on uh, the details of that research, but um, uh, I, I'm oh, wait, getting a note. Um, Ooh, I love this. Yeah, yeah, so we're actually meeting um, next week with the uh, uh, the stakeholders and the and the participants, and we'll have um, we'll get back to you, ma'am, on on exactly what we're doing in that area. That would be great. Um, especially, I'm I of, of course I'm very concerned about passengers, uh, and I'm very concerned about the all the folks who make their livelihood spending time on planes. So, uh, thank you for your time, and I yield back. Thank you. I recognize uh, Representative Rouser for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank each of you for being here uh, this morning. Uh, as you know, my home state of North Carolina is one of uh, the nine participants in the FAA's UAS Integration Pilot Program, and their focus has been on routine drone delivery of medical packages, and so far, there have been more than 1,200 operations on the Wake Med Hospital campus there in Raleigh. Now, this is the first uh, routine drone medical package delivery operation for compensation in our country and a significant step forward for faster and easier delivery between medical facilities. Uh, can you speak to how the data uh, gathered from this pilot program is helping the FAA find solutions to restraint or restraints on integration within the current regulatory framework, such as restrictions on flying beyond visual line of sight or flight over people? Uh, how are these efforts uh, coming along? Well, thank you for that question, Mr. Rouser. The, uh, the, the UAS uh, implementation integration pilot program uh, specific to your, to your district has been a huge success, um, as you mentioned. Uh, the blood delivery on campus back and forth uh, has greatly expedited um, the delivery of samples, which of course uh, in turn gets results quicker to, for patients. I understand, I'm told that I, uh, I think UPS is gonna try to operationalize that much the way Google Wing has operationalized their IPP uh, project in Blacksburg, Virginia, uh, to do deliveries. And what the IPP has done, the project in North Carolina and in Virginia and at seven other uh, pilot projects around the country has given us the data we need to start certifying these operations for eventual integration. Um, we, uh, the Google Wing, for instance, went through a part 130, 135 certification, and that, that's un, it was unprecedented, it hadn't been done before. Uh, we did it for, for that drone operation to prove that we can use uh, our regulatory structure that exists today and modify it for UAS operations. Um, we have about a year, a little bit more than a year left in the study and the pilot program for the nine uh, different projects. Um, we're gonna take the, the lessons learned, and, and there, there are many, um, and that tied to rules like remote ID. Eventually, we'll get a beyond visual line of sight rule, over people rule. Um, these are not easy tasks by any stretch, but putting them together, uh, we'll be able to integrate drones safely safely into the airspace. And, uh, and, our, and our goal also is that when this pilot program rolls up, uh, it's not, we're not gonna tell the nine participants, okay, thank you very much, go home. The, the idea is to um, allow those that wish to uh, become uh, and, and stay and operationalize their, their, uh, their programs. That our goal is to help them do that. And again, if I may add to uh, the administrator's comments, Congressman, um, from the Department of Transportation's perspective, um, what the IPP allows is insofar as it's possible for a regulatory agency to become a cutting edge regulator, um, this is allowing us to be on the cutting edge of developing regulations to, as uh, Dan mentioned, uh, integrating d drones safely uh, into our manned national airspace. Um, uh, other countries are experimenting as we are, uh, but what they are doing is mostly on a catch as catch can and exception basis. Uh, we're trying to develop this systematically uh, so that we can actually have the regulations in place based on uh, these pilot programs uh, that will allow us to give, for example, more Part 135 certifications so whatever lessons we learned can be applied nationally. Talk about uh, the role of local and, and state government and the interface there and, and how that will operate. So um, that was in the presidential directive of something that we wanted the IPP, the, the, the nine different programs, to to examine federalism versus preemption. Um, and um, it's a great question because what we don't want to foster are hundreds of different regulatory frameworks that the industry would eventually have to comply with. You know, if I'm in this county, I gotta do this. Um, but at the same time, we, we have to strike that balance to allow localities. Uh, localities know their issues better than, obviously better than the federal government. So we gotta strike that balance, to your point. Um, to allow municipalities, uh, states, tribal organizations, the ability to make restrictions that don't um, challenge uh, uh, federalism, um, but, um, but are good for the community, good for the, for, uh, the industry, but ultimately safe uh, for all the participants. And we're learning a lot from the pilot program in that regard. What about sharing of radar feeds? Uh, do you anticipate uh, 
FAA to share radar feeds with, at local and state level? Yes or no? No. I, I, uh, I didn't hear the question. question. Sir, I'm sorry. You have, to, you have to take it for the record. Okay. Yeah. We'll get back to you, sir. Uh, you, Mr. Chair. You're welcome. Uh, next, we have uh, Mr. Carbajal before Representative Carbajal starts. On our side, it'll be Carbajal, Stanton, and Lynch in that order. On the Republican side, it'll be Perry, Katko, and Stauber in that order. Representative Carbajal, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Administrator Alwal, thank you for coming to our subcommittee today and for giving us an update of this FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018. Building on some of the questions by my colleagues regarding colleges, college centers of excellence, Section 631 of that measure authorized a new program known as Community and Technical College Centers of Excellence in small unmanned aircraft systems tech, technology training. This section is intended to help establish an expanded role for community colleges in education and training in various applications of small drone technology. In my district, Allen Hancock College is a community college that is focused on innovation and has the interest in the Section 631 Centers of Excellence program. The college is located on a site of the former Hancock College of Aeronautics, which opened its doors 90 years ago and trained thousands of pilots for service during World War II. Section 631 provides opportunities for a school such as Ellen Hancock College to work with industry partners to train students in the latest applications of drone technology. April 5, 2019 was the deadline for the FAA to have established a process to designate community colleges UAS centers of excellence. Could you update this subcommittee on the status of Section 631 for the Centers of Excellence program? And two, what type of consultation has taken place with the Department of Education and Labor to develop this program? Thank you, Mr. Carvajal, for that question. Um, and we, in the discussion earlier with Mr. Gallagher, um, we are, um, we have no issue with the intent, um, nor the deadline uh, the problem we ran into um, ultimately was that centers of excellence are not, uh, we have many of them, um, agreements with uh, center of excellence agreements, um, but they're not uh, vehicles for grants. So um, I would love to see a, a lot more um, small colleges uh, get help with providing UAS training. And um, so would Secretary Chow. That was one of the key uh, conversations we had in our in our workforce summit last year around this time. Um, I will uh, commit to get back to you, sir, on the engagement that we've had with DOL and DOE um, and uh, the extent to which um, we have brought them into the discussion. Uh, and um, if if we need to expand that um, that interagency discussion, we'll we'll certainly do that. The the goal is to improve and increase and. Um, uh, uh, energize our, our um, secondary education in these fields. And so um, I, I, I commit to work with, with you and, and the other agencies as necessary. To that end, how could uh, schools such as Allen Hancock College prepare uh, for future consideration of uh, this section's uh, benefits? I think um, a desire to have curricula that uh, address um, these emerging technologies is preparation enough. I think it's incumbent upon um, the government entities uh, to facilitate and certainly not to provide any sort of hindrance to those who are willing um, and, and want to bring that in, uh, bring that um, into their curricula. You know, one of the things that, that we have at the FAA is um, accreditation for aviation schools. We have four-year accreditation, two-year accreditation, uh, and we're, we're trying to advertise to young people that, you know what, education's expensive, but you can go to a two-year vocational tech school for aviation uh, in, our, in, in the aviation world and come out with, with really good uh, careers, really good professions, and, um, and, and I'm sure that as the UAS industry grows, there'll be more and more opportunities in that area as well. 
Thank you. Uh, as was discussed uh, by some of my previous colleagues, I too have been contacted by a number of my constituents about airplane noise. And uh, the FAA reauthorization included several provisions to address this issue. What is the estimated time frame for the FAA to implement these mandates? And how is the FAA working with communities like mine to address these issues? Well, sir, there's uh, um, noise is a, is a huge issue nationwide, um, and we uh, are actively working all of the provisions in the bill. Uh, uh, we have every intention of, of meeting all the requirements. Uh, since they are different, um, a number of different provisions and different, different requirements, different lengths of implementation, uh, I can assure you, sir, that we, we are working all of them and we'll, um, we'll, we'll, uh, have, we have every intention of meeting the requirements of the bill. Since I'm out of time, if you could just give me some timelines, that would be great. I will get back to you on the timeline, sir. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Uh, before I recognize uh, Representative Perry, I, I just want to uh, clarify the record. Uh, the last time the United States uh, conducted a full-scale evacuation uh, was 1999 for the 777, and then Boeing uh, based their certification on the 787 through comparative analysis to that. Uh, and I don't know whether EASA requires or not, but Airbus, uh, you know, did that in Europe and not under our auspices. And then finally, in terms of uh, recent incidents, uh, a number of people died on an air flight plane who were unable to uh, evacuate. We don't know all the circumstances there since it took place in Russia. Anyway, Mr. Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Director, or correction, Administrator El Elwell, the provision that I had placed in the FAA bill required the FAA to update existing regulations to authorize the carriage of property by owners of UAS for compensation or hire. In your testimony, you state this work is ongoing and the FAA is currently meeting the intent of the mandate through an exemption process. I am pleased to see the FAA grant the first certification this year, but it came only after long and arduous process of seeking numerous ex, uh, exemptions from Part 135 provisions that do not and cannot apply to UAS. Avoiding this type of unnecessary, drawn out, and burdensome exemption process was actually the intent of, of the mandate. The deadline to update these rules is October 5th of this year, nine days from now, but we have yet to see any FAA action on this mandate, so it doesn't appear that this deadline will be met. Can you just provide us with a status update on the mandate and a new timeline for meeting it if you have one? Um, yes, Mr. Perry, thank you for that question. Um, uh, the, the desire to have UAS perform those certificated activities um, we share we share the goal to get that to get that done um, I, it's important to point out uh, there is frustration how long this is taking but I think what what we need to understand is uh, unlike a lot of other countries that are trying to trying to integrate UA, or trying to fly UAS and get UAS to do things many other countries are doing that segregated they're taking UAS and they're flying UAS in airspace where there's nothing else. We're integrating UAS, and it is a far, far more complex endeavor. Um, some of the activities you mentioned, sir, would require beyond visual line of sight carriage or over people. Um, and these are rulemaking activities uh, that have um, significant safety implications um, and we have to make sure that we do the, the rulemaking for those specific abilities, the ability of an unmanned uh, aviation vehicle to, to fly over, over people or beyond visual line of sight. These, these are very complex, and, and both of those capabilities, which are, would eventually be needed for commercial activity, rely upon remote ID, which we've talked about is gonna take a little while. So um, I, I absolutely share your desire to see this happen. Uh, I think we're in, we're in um, a, a, a very, very dynamic time in aviation in this country between uh, the attempts to integrate UAS, uh, the doubling of commercial space launches. I mean, there's, there's so much going on. But we, uh, it's not gonna be done as quickly as many um, th would like, me included. We have to... Administrator, like, we get it, I'm sure, and we know it's complicated. Um, 
and uh, at the same time, also, you know, also deadlines, suspenses, requirements motivate agencies, individuals, you name it, to to get to a result, right? I mean, the the, the federal government isn't immune to producing what is asked of it. It's 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 bosses and my bosses, the taxpayers and constituents demand it. They don't want to hear. They understand that sometimes things don't go as we wish they would, as we hope they could, or what have you. But it doesn't sound like you have any idea. I hate to say it that way, but if you do, I mean, th this was the timeline that we had. So I think I'm fair, it's fair to say that we're not going to meet it, but, you know, six months, 100 years, what are we looking at? Yeah, I, Ms. Perry, the, the only real suspense in putting new type of activity into the airspace. The, the only deadline the FAA really has at the end of the day is safety. And I agree with you, placing, um, uh, placing a, a, a deadline out there uh, does motivate people. But at the end of the day, if it can't be effectuated, if it can't be done um, and, and and signed off on safely, it's going to be extended. And for that reason, um, you know, I, I always hesitate in these questions. What's the timeline to do X or, or, or Y? Uh, I'm not even going to pin you down to a day or something, but can you give us some idea if this is years, if this is months? You know, you, 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 you try and meet a deadline, you find out what's in your way, and then you figure out what's it going to take to get through these six barriers or three things or whatever. You make a new timeline. Recommend you get back uh, to Representative Perry with a timeline. Can you do that? Can you get back to Representative Perry and the committee with a timeline? Yes. Rep recognize Mr. Uh, Representative Stanton from Arizona for five minutes. All right. Mr. L, one of the key purposes of the Congress, of course, is to put the appropriate things into the law and then to uh, ask about the timelines for implementation. That is uh, one of the key roles of the people up here on this uh, on this dais. I appreciate the nature of your concerns about it, but um, that's what we do for the people that we uh, represent. Mr. Rowell, the FAA Reauthorization Act includes several important changes related to the contract tower program, including Section 152 authorizing the FAA to make grants to these airports from the small airport fund to construct or improve their air traffic control towers. In Arizona, Phoenix makes the Gateway Airport is one of the fastest growing regional airports and the busiest contract air traffic control tower in the country just last five years. Annual operations have increased 80% and commercial activity continues to grow by double digits. The existing tower was constructed in 1970 by the Air Force, not intended for commercial use. An FAA siting study identified the need for a new tower due to several safety issues with the existing tower. A new air traffic control tower is critical for this airport, and with 90% of the design completed for a new tower, federal funding for its construction must be a priority. What is the status of the FAA's implementation of Section 152? So we're meeting all the requirements on contract towers, and uh, we don't see any problem with it. We're, we're going we're gonna to meet them all. Um, with respect to uh, Williams Gateway, um, personal connection there, it's where I learned to fly, um, Williams Air Force Base, and, uh, and, and then it came full circle, and, and one of the first meetings I had in this capacity was the mayor of Mesa telling me, we need a new tower, but we're only, uh, we're only eligible for two million towards it, and I'm really glad to see that we fix that, and that you're gonna get a new tower. It is the busiest contract tower in the country, and I'm glad to see we finished, we, we just gave 1.3 million for the design study, uh, it's going to be a 20-some-odd million project, but it will be funded. All right. We're nostalgic for the name Williams uh, Gateway. It's now Phoenix Mesa Gateway Airport as it's gone commercial, but thanks for your service. We appreciate that very much. In April, the FAA hosted a series of workshops in the Phoenix area to hear from residents about flight noise. Those workshops are part of the 2017 lawsuit settlement over noise uh, in the area, a lawsuit filed by the city of Phoenix when I was mayor. I appreciate the FAA holding these workshops. Going forward, it's important for the FAA to work closely with the impact to communities to incorporate what was learned at these workshops and to make adjustments necessary to lessen the noise impacts from the eastbound flight path. What are the FAA's next steps in this process, particularly as additional engagement with the impaired communities, Scottsdale, Fountain Hills, and what's the expected timeline? 
Well, sir, we, uh, we, it's a two-step process, as you're aware. We finished uh, step one, looking at departure route changes uh, based on the community engagement. We have now completed uh, the engagement phase of step two and looking at those, uh, those um, recommendations. Um, uh, as you know, uh, there's no commitment to make changes after uh, consultation in step two, but what anything we can do, we're going we're gonna to do. And um, I'd have to get back to you on the timeline of that. I, I'm, I'm sure that the, uh, um, uh, the folks that are having those meetings uh, have, a, have a deadline for when they're going to get back. We'll follow up. I appreciate that very much. Let's talk staffing shortages. Staffing shortages in the FAA and the impact it's having on your regulatory functions. These staffing shortages are causing delays in approval of environmental reviews, and I and so many other members of Congress are concerned that these delays will have a ripple effect in delaying important construction projects. What steps is the FAA taking to address current staffing needs, particularly on the regulatory side, to ensure timely environmental reviews? Well, sir, I'll have to get back to you on that. Um, uh, I'm to get any specifics on staffing shortages for environmental reviews, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you. I know sure. that they, you know, depending on whether it's a, a CADEX or a, an EA or an EIS, um, uh, they, can be, they can be rather lengthy. And obviously the size of the, of the um, examination can have a big impact, but um, unless Lirio- That's fair answer, we'll, get, we'll, we'll follow up and I appreciate you uh, taking the time to get back to me on that issue. I want to turn now to Flagstaff's Pulliam Airport in northern Arizona. Flagstaff averages more than 100 inches of snow annually. Its airport is classified as a very large airport, meaning as at least a million square feet of total paved runway must be cleared during snow events. The airport has applied for an FAA supplementary discretion grant to construct a multi-use equipment building. The airport's current storage facility is at full capacity, doesn't have room for additional, to store additional equipment, including no, no additional room for snow equipment uh, that the airport purchased last year. The proposed multi-use building will provide much needed storage to protect the airport's extensive equipment. I just want you to know that I support their request and uh, look forward to working with you and want you to keep me updated on the status of that project. We'll keep you updated on that request, right. sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Recognize Representative Katko for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I want to note for the record that Syracuse gets a lot more snow than what you're talking about in Arizona. <laughs> Up to 190 inches. Without yet, objection, so noted. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, uh, thank you all for testifying today. And uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Elwell, I want to, I want to uh, talk to you about something I, I presume you're familiar with, and that's the uh, the unmanned aircraft system facilities and testing programs we have in central New York, in my, uh, in my district and adjacent. The Griffiths New Air Complex, which is out of the former Rome Griffiths Air Base, there's a corridor, a testing corridor from there to Syracuse. It's well established. It has a tremendous amount of state support, local support, municipal support. It's also partly uh, uh, included is a tribal res reservation, the United Indian Reservation. And there's a lot of uh, uh, testing and research going on already, which we're, uh, um, we're quite proud of. Uh, there's been two times where we've uh, submitted uh, funding requests or test pilot requests uh, to the FAA. And given our very mature program, uh, it was shocking to see that in both times, despite having uh, very, very high rankings, neither time were we, were we, were we uh, chosen as test sites. And in fact, some were clearly inferior were chosen over us, and that is, um, to say the least, uh, concerning to us. So uh, now we're here we are again. Uh, in June, the, the UAS Integration Office issued a broad agency announcement calling for development proposals from participating UAS test sites. Um, we submitted a proposal, we being the, the uh, Griffiths New Air com uh, uh, Complex, submitted a proposal, and we're waiting on a status. It was supposed to be reported this month, and I'd like to know what the, what the, uh, uh, any updates on when we're going to find out about that. Thank you, Mr. Katko. Could you repeat what the program you're applying for is? It's the, it's the, the UAS Integration Office at FAA issued a broad agency announcement calling for development proposals from participating US, UAS test sites. We submitted a proposal, we being the New Air Griffiths and the local. And I say we because we're a team, all of us together on all, all levels of government. And it's been very frustrating with, uh, with the, the selection processes in the past for support of these things. So um, I'm asking now, I know we're waiting for a, a, a decision-making process, which we're suspected to get this month. 
uh, and that's what we were told, and we haven't heard anything. So we're waiting. We're asking from you if you can give us any updates on that. Yes, sir. Well, I'll, I'll get you an update on that. I'm not familiar with that particular um, application and proposal, but I'll certainly uh, look into it and get back to you on that. Okay. Are you are you uh, are you familiar at all with the New Air Griffiths test site? I am. Okay. I am. How, how, what do we, what do you know about it? I know. I I believe at least. Uh, um, a year or so ago, Hoot Gibson was was running uh, uh, a, a part of the operations there, and it's a, a colleague and a friend who who I worked with at the FAA. I know that they um, have. I know I'm familiar with the corridor. I'm familiar with uh, 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 the testing and, and the the activities they're doing there. Okay, uh, you've, are you familiar with the application they they, they put in a, uh, a year or two ago for the integrated pilot program uh, and to be selected as one of the uh, one of the sites, and we were been by far the most well-funded site, and all had uh, all had excellent ratings, and we didn't get it. Be familiar with that that process? Well, sir, I, I know I know that uh, um, I remember the the process, but I, I don't remember all of the individual applicants. Um, Are you familiar with the second application that the Rome Griffiths made for the uh, the UTM pilot program, which we were already working on there, which was already well established, and again we had superior marks on everything. And we didn't get that. We, are, you, are you familiar with that process? I'm familiar with the UTM. Again, I'm familiar with the UTM uh, program, um, but I, I, I can't, I can't say that I'm familiar with the details of that application. Of well, I would ask to get a quick response to my first question. That was uh, when we're, we're waiting to hear on this third application we've made, okay. and I'd like to get that quickly. But it, it, it brings up a broader point. Um, this, this UAS testing is a very important thing for the future of our country. I also said on Homeland Security, and on Homeland Security, it's clear that the, the safety component and the anti-terrorism component yep. of what they're doing at Griffiths Rome is extremely important to, our, to the, the, the future of, our, of, of this industry. And it seems like some of the programs that FAA has rolled out, the testing programs, the pilot programs, have been influenced by things other than just getting the best possible sites to get the money. And I would ask that you take a look at that, and I ask that FAA took look, take a look at that. Lord knows they've heard from me, but it is concerning that on such an important and vital program that extraneous things seem to be influencing who gets test pilots and who gets, who gets priority in funding and, and uh, priority in testing. And uh, we have the best moneyed uh, base, uh, best, best, one of the best supported uh, test sites in all the country. And we've been supported by great, uh, greatly by industry. And I ask that you uh, take a little more serious moving forward. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Before we move forward, to just uh, for those members who are here in order on our side, we have uh, Lynch and Garcia. And on the Republican side, Stauber, Massey, and Fitzpatrick. And before we go to Steve Lynch, I just want to ask Mr. Stauber if he wanted to get in on the Who Has the Most Snow in the World contest taking place in the committee. And Mr. Chair, I was thinking the same thing, but I'll yield back. Okay. All right. Great. All right. Uh, we'll go with uh, Representative Lynch from uh, Massachusetts, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and the ranking member for this hearing, and thank you to the full committee, uh, Chair, Mr. DeFazio. I do want to take a moment to recognize and acknowledge uh, Ms. Nadia miller -on. She's the mother of Samia Stu Stumo uh, from my state of Massachusetts. Uh, by all accounts, her daughter was a bright and remarkable young woman. She was tragically killed in the Ethiopian 737 MAX air disaster. She's here with... Uh, other members of victims' families, and uh, we are indeed grateful for their willingness to come forward and to hold people accountable in memory of their loved ones. Uh, Mr. Elwell, so I, I have to just take some exception to your description of uh, the FAA's willingness to engage with the community, local communities. You know where this is going, right? Uh, in your response to Ms. Craig and Ms. Uh, Ms. David's you talked about the way the FAA goes out and meets with local uh, communities that are affected. And I have to tell you, uh, I've been here 18 years. I've been looking for meetings probably for the last 12. We've had one community meeting in my area, Logan Airport, in Milton. Got 700 people there. There was a Celtics game that night, and we still got 700 people there. People are... I, my phone blew up. When you were saying how good the FAA was with community engagement, my phone blew up. I know the people in Milton and South Boston and Georgia are throwing stuff at their TVs right now because of your statement. So that is totally false. That is totally false, and we need to do better, okay? I'm not going to go further than that, but it's, it's deplorable, your outreach. The only reason we had the one meeting that we had 
I put a floor amendment on to pull $25 million from the last FAA authorization because you weren't doing outreach. And Mr. Schuster, who was the Republican chair, agreed with me. And then we had a meeting with, with uh, the DOT secretary, myself, and, and, and Mr. Schuster. And for $25 million, me withdrawing my amendment to remove $25 million from the, the FAA budget, they gave me a meeting. And I'll do it again if that's what it takes, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't. Uh, by the way, there's some good news. There's some good news from the FAA. Uh, look, I, I was one of the people that sponsored this uh, health study because you, you're putting thousands and thousands of planes over the same houses in Milton, Massachusetts, and Hull, and South Boston, and Dorchester, and I think it's in, impacting the health of my, my constituents. So we're gonna do a study. We could do a meeting, a public meeting, and the FAA could come in and talk about their work with, with uh, the Boston University School of Public Health. You know, Dr. Le Levy is, is running that. That's good news. You could talk about the fact that the FAA has funded, you didn't say this, but the FAA has funded the emissions study that we asked for, for pollution over these homes, and also the noise, noise study, you've, you've done that as well. That's good news. You could come into my district and talk to my constituents and explain about the good things you're trying to do. But that's not, we, that's not the history we've had with you. It's like pulling teeth to get the FAA to come in and talk to people. I have to describe the attitude of the Boston uh, office of the FAA as, you know, they treat us with contempt. They really do. They really do. And so people are upset. You've got some good news to, to, to tell of the things you're trying to do. You just need to tell them. Come in and tell them. They yell at me. They'll, they'll probably, you know, they'll probably, the folks are pretty mad about what's going on. You know, you get thousands and thousands of flights over the same homes every single day, and, and that gets people upset. You've got a study in here to talk about dispersal. Let's, let's talk about that. But, you know, we, we, we need to do better. Uh, also, on behalf of my colleague, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton, who sits beside me, and she's also my co-chair of the Quiet Skies Caucus, we've been trying to get the new uh, administrator for the FAA in to meet with the Quiet Skies Caucus for a while now. We sent a letter on August 5th, and we have not heard back. So we would really appreciate if uh, they would de deign to just... Uh, attend with us and talk about these issues. But uh, I think that's all I've got, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but we really got to do much better. And I, I think I speak on behalf of my other colleagues that represent metro areas that, that have airports uh, in them, that we really got to do a much better job with community communication between us and the FAA, okay? Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. I recognize uh, Representative Stauber for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate you holding this meeting. I want to give you a scenario, and I'll be, I think I can be pretty detailed on it uh, to make my point. Let's say a husband and wife, four kids, one with special needs. Let's say it's Down syndrome. The, pro, the, uh, the, the child is severe and profound, walks very slow, lovable kid. And that family decides to leave Duluth, Minnesota, let's say to come to Washington, D.C., for example. And uh, the, the, the special needs child in that family is uh, walks slow, he's being pushed down the aisle, and the plane is delayed, the family has that connection in Minneapolis to come to D.C., the plane's delayed, and the family were to ask uh, the flight attendant, can you help? We have a special needs child. We are delayed now. Is there some wheelchair accessible folks that can meet that family uh, to get them to make their flight to DC? And um, keep in mind this child walks slow. He walks at his pace. And the answer is we're not sure. So the family gets off the plane. They've got about 17 minutes uh, to get down to a gate that's in the different part of the airport. And they make their flight barely. Mom and dad are stressed. The other kids are frustrated. And so is the child. Can you imagine? I just gave you a scenario. Do you know who that family is? That's my family. The new reauthorization act requires 
the, the assistance of individuals with special needs to have the best practices. I would say, uh, Mr. Zabat, please, as you put this forward, talk to the special needs community and those people with disabilities. They know the best in their families. With that being said, as my, the, the, the gentleman uh, spoke earlier, FAA is doing some great things. I fly it every week. I see the successes. But please take that seriously when there's suggestions. Because the stress that my family was put under to make the inauguration of me, the swearing in, was critically important. And it was very stressful during those, that, that period of time when we couldn't get that assistance we needed. And I'm not blaming anything, anybody, Mr. Zabat. I'm telling you the experience from a member of Congress on this subcommittee. I'm so grateful to be here to share this with you because I think personal stories matter. And I trust that you will take uh, not only my concern, but the other's concern as you put in best practices for our special needs in uh, disabled community. And with that, I'll, I wanna quickly ask, what is what are we doing? Are you seeing some good suggestions coming forward to make it easier, less stressful, and to make it uh, the, the special needs population where they're treated fairly and equally? Can you give me some ideas where you're at right now? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman, uh, for your obvious passion in the issue uh, and for your work and the committee's work of putting these provisions uh, into the FAA reauthorization, uh, both for wheelchair access uh, and for trained service uh, for the people who are required to take wheelchairs. Uh, like you, we take these requirements seriously. Uh, with that, I want to turn this over to uh, uh, Assistant General Counsel uh, Blaine Workey, who's also our aviation consumer advocate and has been working with advocates on this issue. Um, thank you for that question. I am very sorry to hear about uh, what happened to your family or any family that, that uh, experiences that kind of difficulty in obtaining access when they travel. Uh, that, that's simply not acceptable. Um, we uh, enforce the Air Carrier Access Act, which prohibits discrimination against air travelers with disability. Um, we investigate every disability complaint that we receive, and we send a response to the complainant to let them know how their complaint has been resolved. Uh, we also work very closely with the... Yeah, so I just have 30 seconds. What I'm asking is, do you have anything uh, today on, on some best practices that you're implementing that, uh, with the information you have? And I only have 20 seconds. Sure. Um, so if you only have 20 seconds, I will say take a look at our website. We do have best practices available on our website on the airconsumer.dot.gov. There is information on disability access. We are also going to be working on some of these issues with the Air Carrier Access Act Advisory Committee. I look forward to uh, the results, and thank you, Mr. Chair, for bringing up uh, the uh, special needs population in your opening statement. Very welcome. Uh, <clears throat> now turn to Mr. Garcia uh, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman and uh, Ranking Member as well. Uh, while I was not a member of the Congress when the 115th uh, Congress passed the long-term FAA reauthorization, I have followed its implementation. Uh, Mr. Elwell, Mr. Uh, Sabat, I understand that uh, uh, some of the over 400 mandates in the FAA bill had short implementation uh, timelines. Having said that, I'm really concerned about the time it's taken to advance several safety provisions that I personally think ought to be advanced more quickly. I will just leave it at that. A question for Mr. Elwell. Uh, before I get into the, into the 2018 FAA bill, I do want to ask you directly, uh, like I did earlier this year, of safety workers testifying before this committee. In 2012 and 2016, twice now, Congress directed the FAA to address safety gaps between domestic aircraft repair stations and foreign repair stations. The FAA is now more than seven years overdue to create an enforceable rule to raise the standards for foreign repair stations regarding security background checks and alcohol testing. When will the FAA implement this rule? Mr. Garcia, thank you uh, for that question. Um, obviously, um, as testified in, before this committee on several occasions, it's a very, uh, very complex rule, requires a navigation um, 
the law requires that we navigate the home country um, laws with regard to to, uh, uh, to alcohol testing. Um, but obviously, also uh, the beginning of this um, rule making and and the the law that was first passed predates me. And so, if uh, if if you would permit, I'd, I'd ask our um, our Bri expert briefly, please. Yes. Um, good afternoon, sir. So we did actually publish an AMPRM, an advance notice for proposed rulemaking in 2014. Um, we were seeking comments on how we would implement the provision because of the complexity of working with the various international partners. Um, we were able to get some information on cost, benefit analysis, as well as the systems that are in place in the foreign uh, locations where we have repair stations that are certified. I think uh, we've drafted an MPRM. It is actually in coordination. It's not easy to draft a rule of general applicability with the various international um, frameworks that are existing related to drug and alcohol testing. So I would say that it is a rule that we have drafted. We hope to move it through the executive coordination so that we can publish that notice for comment um, so that we can gather some more information so that we can further the implementation. However, in the meantime, I think we've, we've made improvements to address the risk. Um, under Part 145 certification, which is for the repair station, we actually established an MOU with TSA and the FAA in the background checks so that we can address the security aspects of those people. We may not be able to look at drug and alcohol, but we can look at the security application based on their background checks. And also, as a 121 operator, which is an air carrier operator, they has the responsibility to have a safety management system. Any part of their system, which could include repair station certifications that they would be utilizing through contractual benefits, they're responsible to address any risks that they would see there and assure that they mitigate that risk. Okay, so thank you. I think that will suffice for now because my time will run out if I let you continue. On the topic of safety, in the 2018 bill, the questions of minimum seat size, distance between roads, uh, safety and evacuation times has been addressed uh, by Chairman DeFazio. I thank him for that. Uh, the third question, Mr. Elwell, after leaving them out in the 2012 bill, the 2018 FAA bill instructed the Department of Transportation to implement a 10-hour rest period for flight attendants. Mind you, these flight attendants can often work up to 16-hour shifts, and the rest period does not take into account time for deplaning to get to and from hotel to actually rest. The DOT missed the statutory deadline uh, to implement the rule by November 4th of 2018 and did not even begin a formal process until February of this year. I understand you may be starting action now. What took so long and why did uh, DOT feel the need to do a full comment period when the law this body passed gave no discretion to augment how the regulations should be written? Uh, well, sir, thank you for that question. Um, as we talked about this earlier, um, the law uh, was clear. However, it did not absolve us of the responsibility to uh, do notice and comment. Uh, and for a rule that does not impose directly on the operators, uh, FAA has no choice but to go through rulemaking and notice and comment and uh, benefit cost analysis, which is the biggest reason why it's taken so long. Um, but as we mentioned earlier, sir, um, the, f the fatigue risk management plans uh, are being submitted at a good clip by the 48 uh, d uh, different uh, carriers that have flight attendants. Uh, and that is, uh, meets the need while we go through this rulemaking period. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Before we go to uh, Mr. Massey and Mr. Fitzpatrick, those are the only two members who have left, barring any other members who come. Uh, I do plan to take a five-minute break uh, to reset the the, uh, the panelists. Um, however, uh, if folks who are on the second panel um, want to take an opportunity now for a comfort break, um, if you feel, uh, the timing is about right, so if folks want to think about that. But we will be taking a five-minute break between uh, panelists. Uh, with that, I'll turn to I think, uh, Mr. Massey's next. So I'm the only thing standing in between them and their break? <laughs> maybe, you can handle the pressure, Tom. All right. Maybe I'll get quick answers. Uh, Mr. Elwell, I'm glad to see a pilot in your position, a commercial pilot. I'm sure that's uh, helpful to the taxpayers and to all of us to have your 
view of things. I wanna focus on the data communications portion of NextGen and the implementation of that, specifically the controller pilot data link. Uh, can you talk about the benefits of that and uh, the projected benefits and what some of the benefits are we've seen? Um, so thanks for that question. Uh, CPDLC, Computer Pilot Data Link, uh, um, actually was, uh, the test base for that was Miami and the 757 when I was flying the 757 for Americans. So i um, proud to be- I thought you might have some yeah. relevant experience. So i um, proud to be one of the first pilots to tear off that strip of paper uh, from, from the controller saying to climb to 16,000. And, and so, um, but that, I, I, don't, I don't mean to be light about that, um, um, the uh, datacom, as it's called now, um, has huge benefits, especially uh, we, we implemented it at over 50 towers on the surface because instead of sitting there for 20 minutes waiting to get a word, word in edgewise at a very, very busy airport, you just get a display of what your clearance is, you push a button, you accept it. It, it, it vastly eliminates um, readback and transcription errors. Um, and, uh, and of course, an efficiency in time, not having the chatter on the radio, cleans up the radio, situational awareness is enhanced. I could go on uh, for a long time about the value of it. And, um, and I know where you're going. Uh, if you want me to help on CV, CVG? Yes, that's exactly where I'm going because also fuel savings and safety are benefits of that system. Um, but what I'm told by people who, who like the system, and they say it's a bright spot actually in the next gen implementation that there are some less bright spots and some delays here and there, but and this is one example where it's been helpful. Yep. And I'm, I'm told at the CVG airport, and then I'll, I'll open up and let you tell me this is true, that they have already made the capital investment to implement this, mm -hmm. and that most of the planes that land and take off there have made that capital investment on their own, and uh, just, for your information, which I'm sure you're probably already aware of, the CVG airport cargo has doubled there in the past five years. Amazon located their hub there. DHL moved their hub there. Uh, passenger flights originating there have doubled in the last five years. And what they're wondering is when can they turn that on? Because it's, and I'll open it up to you. Yes, sir. Um, well aware of that, and, and CVG has um, had exciting growth, uh, and they have, they have, importantly, have the capacity for that growth, so it's a good thing to see. Um, one of the criteria for doing and putting Datacom into, into an airport is to assess the equipage rate uh, by all operators at it, because if, if, you, if you don't have the equipage uh, um, critical mass, then, then turning it on doesn't make much sense. So we're in the process of looking at that, um, and once uh, we have the capabilities in the tower and we have the, the equipage on the ground, um, uh, I don't see a reason why we wouldn't turn it on. So um, we'll, we'll get back to you. If there is something um, that, e that either CVG can, can help uh, us to get there, we'll let you know. Um, but uh, I agree, it's, it's the right thing to do and, and in every place we can do it, we're trying to do it. Obviously, the air traffic controllers would need some training on it, but the capital investment is just sitting there unused. That's the capital investment that the taxpayer or the fee payers that the airports have made. And then um, entire fleets there have this technology already in their planes. They were told, you make this investment, then the FAA will uphold its side of the deal and you'll reap these benefits. And so they've made those investments. The FAA has made those investments. Uh, and it's, I mean, the volume there, I think, easily justifies it now. Maybe it didn't five years ago when the plan was put forward. But of this, I mean, I'm glad there's 62 airports that have it. Uh, please get back to me and let me know when, when you think we can get that at CVG. We're, we're a little bit, I'm a little bit concerned that the focus has already moved on to phase two, which is the en route yeah. system. But that's a little, having a little rockier rollout why don't we go ahead and get some of the benefits of the system we know works at other airports? So thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being aware of that situation. Yes, sir. Thank you, uh, Representative Massey. I recognize uh, Representative Fitzpatrick for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Elwell, um, the question that I have for you pertains to an issue myself. Uh, my Democrat colleague, Josh Gottheimer, 
and many, many of my Democrat and Republican colleagues, both in the House and the Senate, care deeply about uh, the issue of secondary barriers. Um, Ellen Saracini, she's uh, with us here today, uh, is the widow of uh, Victor Saracini, <clears throat> a constituent of mine who was the pilot of Flight 175 that flew into the South Tower of the World Trade Center at 9.03 that morning. And last year, Congress passed the uh, FAA reauthorization bill, uh, including Section 336, uh, named the Saracini uh, Aviation Safety Act of 2018, which mandated secondary barriers in the cockpit of all new aircrafts. Uh, the mission is not complete until we get retrofitting. Uh, we will not stop until we get secondary barriers in every single aircraft that carries passengers. Um, it is one of the few, if not the only, 9-11 commission report yet to be implemented 18 years after 9-11. Uh, the deadline is coming up for the implementation uh, of secondary barriers, and where does the process stand, and what has caused a slow progress on implementation? Well, sir, thank you for that, uh, for that question. Um, and as someone who was uh, intimately familiar um, in 9-11 as a uh, DC-based pilot with American Airlines um, at the time, and, and, and someone who knew the entire uh, crew on um, Flight 77, uh, I can connect um, very strongly to, to this effort. And we are committed, I personally am committed, to seeing that it gets done um, and consistent with the law. Um, and to answer your question, right now the Aviation Rulemaking Advisory Committee uh, has this task to provide comment. Um, I, and I know that we've had this discussion, we've gone back and forth a few times. Um, rulemaking is required. It just, it just, it's just, it just is. It's rulemaking is required for the secondary barriers. And uh, we have uh, begun that process uh, and we will see it to, to its conclusion and it will um, apply to new production and, and, and uh, but we have to do it safely. We have to do it uh, by the law with notes and comment. Um, and, uh, uh, but, but we're gonna get it done. You anticipate that it'll be done uh, by the deadline? I'm sorry, we, the, the question is by the, de by the 18 month deadline? Correct. So we won't have the uh, rulemaking done by that deadline. Do you know when it will be done? Well, sir, we will work um, uh, as expeditiously as the, as the rulemaking allows. Mm -hmm. Rulemaking, once um, the, the, the issue, of course, is giving enough notice and comment time for each stage of the process, which is what uh, always uh, elongates rulemaking. Um, and, and I can't, it's, it's I can get back to you on, on, a, on a more um, granular prediction, but uh, I don't have one right now. Please do, sir. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like uh, to ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter uh, written by uh, Ms. Saracini uh, to this committee. Without objection, sir. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sir, last, one last question uh, regarding drones. Uh, the United States is already falling behind the rest of the world when it comes to unmanned aircraft systems technology. Uh, and these regulatory delays are stifling innovation and investment. What are the reasons for the FAA's delays in this area? And can you commit to the committee today that the FAA will stick to its current schedule and complete these rulemakings as expeditiously as possible? Yes, sir, we're working on, uh, on all of the, the rulemakings um, and getting them done as quickly as, as we possibly can. Um, but I would tell you, uh, I don't ascribe um, to the statement that uh, we're falling behind other countries. There's no other country that can compare to Rule 107. There's no other country that gives the waivers that we've given or is in doing the, the pilot programs that we have, which integrate, and this is the, the, the most important distinction we need to make, sir. Other countries are primarily doing operations in the way of segregating UAS from the rest of the NAS or the rest of their airspace. We're going in with the assumption that our UAS in the U.S. will be integrated. It's a much more complex endeavor, um, and and uh, but I wouldn't I wouldn't characterize it as us falling behind. Um, we're we're tackling uh, larger issues in the most complex, uh, largest and most complex airspace in the world. 
Our time's expired, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, recognize uh, Representative Norton for five minutes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm sorry I couldn't be here for the, for the entire hearing. I'm pleased I could be here for part of it. And uh, I do wanna ask a question that I think is probably more relevant to my colleagues than to me. I may be the only of my colleagues who doesn't get, have to get on an airplane every week. I just go nine blocks to Capitol Hill where I live. But I read recently uh, something that troubled me a great deal. Uh, it, there were incidents uh, where the planes came down safely. I was pleased to hear that. But passengers had to evacuate uh, the airline. Uh, now, under uh, the existing regulations, you're supposed to evacuate aircraft within 90 seconds. Um, that's a very short period of time after a plane goes down. But what these incidents reported or what the press reported was that as people were trying to get out of the airline, they were grabbing their carry-on <laughs> baggages and obviously thereby slowing up evacuation. Now, that can be a life and death matter. You got your baggage, but you don't survive. <laughs> um, our authorization does ask the FAA, of course, you haven't had time to fully assess, but it asks uh, the FAA to assess and report to Congress on whether the assumptions and methods certifying uh, co uh, compliance with evacuation requirements should be revised. Uh, Mr. Uh, Elwell, I'm bringing that up because I, uh, already it seems to me that some revision should occur and I understand that the FAA has initiated a rulemaking uh, committee to address this issue. I would be very interested given recent events to know the status of the, that, that mandate you apparently are working on now. Oh, thank you, Ms. Norton, for that question. Um, we have uh, created a um, emergency evacuation aviation rulemaking committee at ARC, um, and uh, its first meeting was uh, first meeting is is in a matter of weeks, I believe. Um, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna uh, use the ARC, which of course, as you know, is a gathering of uh, stakeholders and industry experts. Um, for their for their comment and their advice on how to go forward, um, we have been having an active conversation with this committee and with our stakeholders. Um, and uh, I can't remember if you were here when when we talked about um, ground evacuation live tests. We have 12 days of testing um, that is uh, scheduled for November. I believe it starts uh, November 3rd or 5th through December. Uh, we're going to have 12 days. We have 720 uh, folks that are going to participate. Uh, we're going to gather uh, over 3,000 data points. Um, to your point, it's to, um, I, I agree, and agree with Chairman DeFazio, it's a priority of his as well, that we, we, we need to, uh, to look at evacuation and make sure that, um, um, that we have all the right assumptions mm -hmm. um, and uh, to ensure that in, in these instances folks can get out of... Uh, can get out of airplanes in emergencies. Well, I, 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 wasn't, I wasn't here and didn't hear that essentially this is going to be testing these assumptions with people getting on and off airplanes. Mm -hmm. uh, because my last question was going to be where did 90 seconds come from? One of the things I'll be interested in is whether or not anybody tested to see whether it's realistic to, to, to uh, believe that people, the full airplane can get off in 90 seconds uh, and if that was just pulled out of the air or if it was based on testing. I, I can get back to you on the assumptions of the original assumptions of the 90 seconds. Um, of course, the, 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 the assumptions of getting off an airplane have to do uh, with flammability, survivability, um, cabin filling with smoke or not. Um, and every incident is different, of course. Uh, 90 seconds could be more than um, enough in some instances or nowhere near enough. Uh, or the accident or the incident could um, could be such that um, they have all the time in the world, and other times um, it's just a matter of seconds. So uh, it's very it's very complex, which is why we've formed the ARC, which is why uh, we have asked industry experts to give us 
uh, advice on uh, and what we need to be looking at. We want to look at the right things, uh, and we want to do it uh, expeditiously, but, um, but we want to make sure we're answering the right questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I recognize uh, Mr. DeFazio. Oh, thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'll make this brief. I appreciate uh, the amount of time that you've given. Uh, but you won't be here for the second panel, and uh, this goes back again to the uh, secondary barriers, and this is in the testimony from uh, ALPA. And uh, it, uh, I was not aware of this, that, uh, that you had already, the FAA has previously developed and published uh, guidelines uh, for secondary barriers using R RTCA, private not-for-profit corporation. Uh, that contain design characteristics, minimum performance criteria, insulation certification guidance, uh, and uh, it's uh, DO329-2011. Uh, and, uh, you know, that seems like maybe we don't need to go through a whole new evaluation process, uh, and uh, we can uh, rely on that and then move forward. Was that a question, sir? Well, I guess. I mean, are you aware of that? And no, we're, no, sir, we're very, we're very aware of 329. In fact, that's what has, since 2011, that is, that is what the airlines are adhering to, the guidance that when you did the example of the flight attendant standing behind the cart, that is part of DO329 guidance. Right, but he, the, the ALPA is, is saying that it has, it has actual design uh, characteristics, minimum performance criteria, and installation and certification guidance for secondary barriers, not flight attendants behind food carts. I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with the document, but I would suggest that uh, we'll get the document, we'll review it, and I would suggest that perhaps, you know, there is more in there than menacing-looking flight attendants behind food carts. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Elwell and Mr. Spott. Uh, and your team, uh, thank teams, thank you very much for uh, testifying today. Um, you can tell by the breadth of the questions, there's a lot of interest in the full implementation of the uh, bill we passed last year, not partially, and you can also tell by the urgency of the questions, the impatience uh, about the timelines. And so we ask you to uh, uh, keep us informed of uh, meeting the timelines that we've asked you to set out um, and uh, on, on a variety of issues. So uh, thank you. With that, we're going to recess for five minutes, and uh, we'll get the room reset. Thank you. We're in recess for five minutes.
going to call us back in from break uh, for the second panel. I want to uh, thank the panelists for your patience. Uh, as you can, you can tell from the first panel, uh, from our members, there's a lot of interest in uh, practically every part of the bill that we passed last year, and that's, that's actually good news. So I appreciate you uh, uh, being here and hanging with us and uh, for your patience. Looking forward to your testimony. Um, and rather than go through uh, biographies, I'm sure for the record, I'll just put that in later. I think I'm allowed to do that. Um, and we'll start um, with uh, Sarah Nelson with AFA CWA. Uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Larson, Chairman DeFazio, uh, ranking members Graves and Graves um, as well, but I'd like to recognize uh, Congressman Fitzpatrick who's sticking with us. Um, so, first of all, I'd like to thank this committee for the extraordinary work that you did with all of the stakeholders to get a long-term FAA reauthorization bill passed. It had been a long time since that had happened, um, and everyone came together, and the votes that you received, we were 393 in the House and 93 in the Senate. This is a clear mandate to move forward with very important safety provisions for our aviation system. And among those was our issue of 10 hours rest for flight attendants. Now, this was an issue of safety, health, and equality. Safety, we had been raising the flag on this issue for more than 30 years, identifying flight attendant fatigue, getting through other FAA reauthorization bills, the Commission of Fatigue Studies, seven in fact, that determined that flight attendant fatigue does exist, and the best way to combat it is rest. And yet, still here today, we don't have that in place. Health. Harvard conducted a flight attendant health study, and the results of those studies were published in the summer of 2018. It determined that flight attendants have, on average, between 50 and 400 percent greater rates of cancer than the public, even though they are a more healthy population. And one of those factors that contributes to cancer, to the greater rates of cancer, is interrupted rest. Now, equality, we are the only country in the world with aviation regulations that do not harmonize flight attendant and pilot rest. This is an issue of equality. So we worked with you very closely to write language that would make it very clear and very simple, and I believe you were very clear with the deputy administrator earlier that it was intended that the rule be, would be changed within 30 days simply changing a one character, eight hours, to a two character, 10 hours, to address flight attendant fatigue, the major mitigating factor that can address flight attendant fatigue by increasing that minimum rest by two hours. For whatever reason, that did not happen. We had a government shutdown. We had a grounding of the 737 MAX. And just now, right before this hearing, days before this hearing, we have an announcement of a rulemaking. Now, I appreciate the attention of the newly confirmed Administrator Dixon on this issue, but there is not a need for a rulemaking on this. This has been litigated, it has been heard, it has been studied. There is a determination that this is a safety loophole in our aviation system, and it needs to be fixed. Flight attendants do not understand how you can write such clear language and not get this in place. They, we have been negotiating with the airlines to put this in place in the meantime. And we have successfully negotiated three new contracts that have the 10 hours rest. In each of those contract negotiations at Miami Air, Frontier, and PSA, the 10 hours rest was implemented within a matter of weeks and there was no cost associated with it in the negotiations. Delta Airlines, hours after the uh, rulemaking process was announced, announced that they would be implementing the 10 hours rest, as is defined in the law, uh, by the February bid month, this coming February bid month, demonstrating that this can be done in a very short period of time. This is not complicated. We still have flight attendants who are out there reporting to us that they have forgotten how they traveled home, how they drove home from their trip. They were pulled over by the police saying that they were acting, driving as though they were impaired, when only moments later they were conducting very serious safety functions that the FAA currently says they were safe to perform, but they were impaired. Others have written to us, why do we have to go through drug testing? 
when the FAA has rest rules that has us impaired doing our work. Others say, I had a medical emergency on board, I had a long day and a short night, and thank goodness there were medical personnel on board because I didn't have the mental capacity to address this or to address the uh, conflicts between passengers or to conduct CPR to save a life. This is serious. We're safety professionals. We're aviation's first responders. Fatigue exists. You gave very specific instruction to the FAA, and this needs to be implemented right away. Now, we are talking with the FAA. This rulemaking will move forward, but we would ask that you do everything in your power to get this to be expedited. I did hear the deputy administrator talk about an emergency order of rulemaking, and this seems to be a, a topic that is, uh, is ripe for that. So thank you very much. I'd like to talk on many more uh, provisions and answer your questions throughout the testimony. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> now turn to Captain Fox. I'm uh, representing ALPA for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Larson, Ranking Member Graves, uh, Chairman DeFazio. Uh, thank you for that last question to um, Captain Elwell. Specifically, the FAA does have what they need right now to implement the rule. They just have not implemented the rule on secondary barriers. That work was done in 2009 by a regulatory piece that they used for an advisory committee. The work's done, it covers 50 seats up to 777s and 787s. They're just stalling and not implementing the rule. I'm proud to represent more than 63,000 members of the Airline Pilots Association, which is the world's largest non-governmental aviation safety organization. We commend this committee for its leadership in guiding Congress to pass a strong, safety-focused, and forward-thinking FAA reauthorization. The true test of success, however, will be how and when the executive branch implements these life-saving advances. Frankly, we are deeply dismayed by the lack of follow-through. A few weeks ago, the United States recognized the 18th anniversary of the attacks of 9-11, Mandating the installation of secondary barriers is one of the most important, cost-effective, security enhancements identified after the attacks. In the reauthorization, Congress called for the FAA to issue a rule mandating these barriers for newly manufactured passenger aircraft by October 5, 2019. Rather than issuing the order as Congress intended, the FAA has bowed to a blatant stall tactic promoted by special interest and created an aviation rulemaking advisory committee, which like I just said, they have already done in 2009. Secondary flight deck barriers are already protecting US airlines. I know because I've flown the Boeing 757 at United equipped with these security devices. The standard established at the FAA's request in 2009 is effective. No more study is needed. ALPA thanks the 110 U.S. House members, including lawmakers in, on this committee, who signed a letter leaving no doubt that they expect the FAA to meet their deadline. We have the data. We know what works. It's time to implement the law. In addition, the FAA reauthorization also prescribed the automatic acceptance of voluntary safety reports obtained through the Aviation Safety Action Program, or ASAP. ASAP is a non-punitive safety reporting program that allows frontline employees, including pilots, to voluntarily report safety issues. Right now, weeks pass before these reports are reviewed. Requiring their automatic acceptance means safety information will be reviewed more quickly, potentially preventing accidents. We have been waiting three years for the FAA to publish an advisory circular requiring automatic acceptance of these reports. Again, we know it works. Let's implement the law. In addition, the re reauthorization directs the FAA to update its requirement for airline pilots to wear oxygen masks above certain altitudes. Currently, if one pilot leaves the flight deck while above flight level 250, the other was, must wear his or her mask. Because of hygiene concerns and a priority on using masks only in emergencies, the International Civil, a Civil Aviation Organization established an altitude standard of above flight level 410, a change that ALPA supports the FAA reauthorization directs the FAA to issue new regulations consistent with the ICAO no later than October 5, 2019. 
Again, we know it works, and we urge the FAA and the U.S. airlines to act. Airline pilots are pleased that the FAA authorization maintains life-saving pilot qualification and training regulations. Thanks to this committee's leadership, these rules have helped ensure that the United States has not had a single fatality in Part 121 passenger flight operations due to a pilot training issue in the past decade. Alpha pilots will spare no effort in fighting any attempt to weaken these requirements. Through ALPA's affiliation with the International Federation of Airline Pilots Associations, we are proactively engaging ICAO to establish a review of pilot qualification and training standards given today's complex operating environment. We know, as do our passengers, that the presence of at least two fully qualified, highly trained, and adequately rested pilots on board our airliners contributes to a proactive, risk-predictive safety culture and is a major reason why the U.S. air transportation system is so safe. Clearly, Congress has the interest of the traveling public at heart in passing this FAA reauthorization. Others should follow your lead and implement as it is intended. We know that for our passengers, our crews, and shippers, every day of delay is one too many. Thank you for this opportunity for me to be here today. Thank you, Captain Fox. And I recognize uh, the other Greg Walden, uh, from the small UAV, small UAV coalition. Thank you. Chairman Larson, Chairman DeFazio, uh, Ranking Member Graves and Graves, uh, members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on the Unmanned Aircraft System subtitle. I'm here on behalf of the Small UAV Coalition, whose members have been involved in every working group and industry partnership the FAA has established with the U.S. community. Coalition members represent the innovative, cutting-edge technological leadership that is poised <clears throat> to enable ubiquitous, commercial UAS operations. We commend Congress for enacting a forward-looking policy roadmap for, UAS, roadmap for UAS integration. Subtitle B addresses all of the issues that are critical to the development of a safe and secure regulatory framework. We also thank you for including two provisions that were necessary to lift the two-year hold on UAS rulemakings. And we especially appreciate Chairman DeFazio's leadership in freeing the FAA to move forward with remote ID that we expect will apply to all UAS operators. We are encouraged that the enrollment ID rule, so far delayed, is now at a review at OMB. Coalition members have demonstrated remote ID technology based on the ASTM standard, which can be implemented today without requiring costly infrastructure or equipage. With respect to unmanned traffic management, or UTM, coalition members had been working in partnership with NASA for several years when we first urged Congress to address UTM and FAA reauthorization. In 2016, you created the two-year pilot program, and with further direction in two, the 2018 law, the program is now underway. Unfortunately, UTM deployment has progressed slowly. While industry is ready to implement UTM capabilities, it must depend on a supportive policy framework to do so. As for aircraft certification, we support Section 44807, which is used to authorize commercial package delivery operations and operations of drones over 55 pounds. The law directs the FAA to set up a process to accept risk-based industry consensus standards. We find much promise in this provision, but it will take some time to work through its complexity. Right now, we support the Specific Operations Risk Assessment, or SORA, uh, which is a, a process initially created by the Joint Authorities for Rulemaking of Unmanned Systems, goes by the moniker JARUS. We also support the FAA's Mosaic Airworthiness Rulemaking Project, and the FAA's work on developing a type certification process for lower-risk UAS operations that relies primarily on a demonstration of reliability and durability. We strongly endorse the U.S. integration pilot program when it was announced. Many coalition members are participating in one or more programs and have had positive experience. On the other hand, we have other reports that suggest success has been uneven. We believe that plenary authority must remain with the FAA in four specific areas, aircraft, airmen, air carriers, and airspace. The FAA must retain its authority over U.S. operations at any altitude. At the same time, state and local governments possess land use and other police powers, and these authorities can coexist, particularly with technical solutions like UTM. We support the requirement that recreational operators pass an online aeronautical knowledge test we expect many recreational operators who would otherwise elect not to travel to a testing center will go online. 
Unfortunately, the FAA did not meet the April deadline to develop a test, and the process to select online testing vendors got off to a slow start. We certainly hope the FAA can begin online testing by the end of this year. The coalition supported extending counter-U.S. authorities to DHS and DOJ, but we believe the guidance required by Section 1602 should be in place before counter-U.S. authority is exercised. For the same reason, we believe it's premature to extend these authorities to airports or state and local governments. The commercial U.S. industry is international in reach, and it's thus very important that the United States assume its global leadership role. We urge the FAA to continue to engage with ICAO and with JARUS, which has developed an effective framework for evaluating complex UAS operations and recently adopted a work plan to address UTM air traffic control interface, autonomous operations, and the UAS flight rules. The FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018 was a major milestone, and we asked this committee to continue its vigorous oversight to ensure that the important directives in the 2018 law are addressed in a timely manner. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. <clears throat> Thank you for your uh, testimony, and now turn to uh, Mark Baker, President of AOPA. Thank you. Chairman Larson, Ranking Members Graves, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss important provisions of last year's FAA Reauthorization Act that impact aircraft owners and pilots and the general aviation community. The AOPA represents over 300,000 pilots and aircraft owners across the United States. We are fortunate to have a very engaged members in every state and congressional district across the country. I am fortunate to have had the privilege to fly in our nation's aviation system for over 40 years. It's an amazing system. It's very safe, modern, and the envy of the world. And this committee has a lot to do with that. I'd like to commend the committee for its work in the passing the Mr. Bypass. Baker, if you could just pull out the microphone a little closer or speak closer? more directly into it. Thank you. Good. I would like to thank and commend the committee for its work in passing a bipartisan five-year FAA reauthorization. Public Law 115254 is widely recognized for both what it includes and what it does not include. Today, I will briefly mention a key provisions that directly and positively impact general aviation. I would like to give a special thanks to Ranking Member Sam Graves for his leadership on several of these provisions in the Act. Thousands of public use airports across this nation rely solely general aviation to connect over 170 million people each year. General aviation contributes over $200 billion annually, annually to our nation's economy and produces 1.1 million jobs. With the support of this committee, Congress has appropriated additional $1 billion in discretionary funds in the fiscal year 2018 to help meet the demand of airport infrastructure needs, another $500 million in fiscal 2019. Speaking for myself and on behalf of those who fly in and out of small airports, we appreciate that support. For many private aircraft owners, aeronautical activity occurring in airport hangars include building and maintaining aircraft. AOPA has long advocated for changes to the definition of aeronautical activity in hangars. Section 131 codifies the FAA's updated hangar use policy so that the realities of general aviation flying, building, and maintenance can be re realized. Several other provisions in the bill are important to the general aviation community, including Section 556, which, as you know, requires the FAA to initiate rulemaking to increase the duration of general aviation aircraft registration from three years to seven years. This is a common sense provision that will help reduce workload and the cost of aircraft ownership, which AOPA strongly supports. Section 518 will keep the aircraft registry open should a government shutdown occur in the future will have a positive impact on general aviation registration requirements. We also support Chairman DeFazio's Aviation Funding Stability Act, which would ensure that all FAA activities are funded in the event of a government shutdown. Section 532 clarifies FAA policy regarding payment of living history flights, which will help continue our efforts to attract new generation of aviation enthusiasts and future workforce for the aviation community. Speaking of our future workforce, Congress and this committee specifically recognize the need to support aviation workforce development programs through Section 625. This was a top priority for AOPI. The Pilot Education Grant Program and the Aviation Technical Workforce Grant Program are each authorized at $5 million per year for the next five years. We remain hopeful that the appropriations process will move forward and that will be fully funded. AOPI has taken a leadership role in developing our future aviation workforce through AOPI's high school initiative by providing high-quality STEM-based edu aviation education to high school students nationwide, AOPA is opening the door to aviation career for thousands of teens. 
where the 2018-19 school year, our curriculum is being used and an estimated 2,200 children, and the ninth grade students, over 80 schools in 27 states, another 461 students at 25 schools in 15 states are using the 10th grade curriculum. During the current year, 161 schools in 34 states are delivering aviation curriculum to these students. Our 11th grade curriculum is currently being field tested, and our ultimate goal is to have a four-year program that will enable students to take and pass written tests to become a private pilot. While not related to the FAA authorization of 2018, I would like to thank the committee and mention the success of the bipartisan legislation passed into law in the extension of the Security Act, also known as a third-class medical, which is referred to now as a basic med. In just over two years since the program has been launched, more than 50,000 pilots are flying safely under these new medical standards. I'm pleased to report the FAA implemented the statute expeditiously and continues to support the success of the law. Finally, Mr. Chairman, we must continue to work together in industry and government to ensure our nation's leadership in all sections of aviation. We're hopeful that the committee will work through Senator Jim Hoff of Oklahoma and others to establish the National Center for the Advancement of Aviation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, the committee appreciates it. And now I'll turn to Mr. John. Is it Brailt? Is that the pronunciation? It's Brayo, but I'll accept Brayo. Okay. I'll well, take Brayo uh, with the National Consumers League. You're, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Larson, Chairman DeFazio, and members of the subcommittee. My name is John Brayo, and I'm the Vice President for Public Policy, Telecommunications, and Fraud at the National Consumers League. I very much appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today and provide the perspective of the flying public to the subcommittee. Founded in 1899, NCL is America's pioneering consumer and worker advocacy organization. Our nonprofit mission is to advocate for social and economic justice on behalf of consumers and workers in the United States and abroad. The DOT is the sole agency in the United States with the power to enforce consumer protection statutes in the air travel marketplace. Unfortunately, progress on too many important consumer protection rulemakings teed up by the 2016 and 2018 FAA reauthorization bills has slowed to a crawl at best and a halt at worst. In my written testimony, I detail the harm suffered by consumers in a number of areas, including overbooking, fee refunds, and the availability of fair fee and schedule data. Today, however, my remarks will focus on two areas of particular concern, minimum seat size standards and family seating. Mr. Chairman, as you are no doubt painfully aware during your five plus hours of flights to and from Seattle, seat sizes on US airlines have been steadily shrinking. Passengers and flight attendants have long expressed concerns about ever smaller seat dimensions and dwindling seat pitch that could put at risk passengers' ability to quickly evacuate an aircraft in the event of an emergency. In response, Congress directed the FAA to issue regulations establishing minimum seat sizes and pitch. Until today's testimony from Mr. Iwell, we, have seen, we had seen no indication uh, that, however, the, the agency was prepared to initiate such a rulemaking by this October's deadline. Indeed, the FAA has actively resisted judicial efforts by consumer advocates pressing it to act on this important safety issue. You must not sit by and allow the FAA to dither, or at worst yet, allow the FAA to simply adopt whatever inhumane and unsafe seat size standard the airline industry favors. A potentially even more serious problem is the issue of family seating. The 2016 FAA Reauthorization Act mandated that within a year of enactment, the DOT must review and quote, if appropriate, unquote, create rules requiring airlines to seat children aged 13 or under next to an accompanying family member. Incredibly, after a review that apparently included no input from family advocates, no comments from psychologists, or any public statements from the airlines, the DOT merely decided to add a page to its website about family seating. The DOT's inaction is particularly troubling in the face of evidence that sexual assault on airplanes against minors is a significant safety concern. According to the FBI, in-flight sexual assaults increased by 66 percent from FY 2014 to FY 2016. In 2017 alone, the FBI opened 63 investigations into sexual assault on aircraft. The FBI found that children as young as eight years old have been victims of sexual assault in the air. Families are right to be concerned for their children's safety. In response to a FOIA request made by my colleagues at Consumer Reports, we now know that from March 2016 to November 2018, 136 complaints were filed at the DOT regarding family seating. 
It is clear from these complaints that when families with young children seek to sit together, airlines regularly impose or attempt to impose expensive fees for preferred seating assignments and priority boarding. Numerous complaints involve airlines knowingly assigning seats apart from family to children as young as two years old. Families with children under the age of five reported being forced to rely on the kindness of strangers or to beg other passengers to switch seats. In numerous cases, families were asked to deplane because of the inconvenience this caused. Parents cited the emotional trauma of children sitting alone on children who are autistic or who suffer seizures. In multiple cases, parents complained they were worried that young children sitting away from them were vulnerable to sexual assaults and could be in particular danger during emergencies. DOT complaints are almost certainly just the tip of the iceberg. And yet, in the face of this evidence, the DOT claims that the number of complaints about families sitting together in the air do not justify action by the agency to protect the most vulnerable flyers. Mr. Chairman, how many children will have to be assaulted on aircraft before the DOT acts? Is the DOT putting the desire of airlines to continue generating more than half a billion dollars annually in lucrative seat reservation fees ahead of children's safety? Simply creating a new consumer education webpage about family seating is not enough. The DOT's inaction on this issue has put children at greater risk. Congress should demand answers from the DOT on the process it used to determine that it should do nothing substantive on this important children's safety issue and mandate that the agency follow through on Congress's clear intent. Chairman Larson, Chairman DeFazio, Ranking Member Graves, and the members of the subcommittee, thank you for listening to the voice of consumers. I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, and last, and the best, from the great state of Washington, uh, Dave Zerflu is the national president of the Paralyzed Veterans of America and really appreciate you making the trip out here. And I just want to, we were talking earlier <clears throat> before we got started about Ernie Butler, who was a, out of uh, Monroe, Washington, and was a great advocate who passed uh, away a few years ago, was a great advocate for the PVA as well. And uh, I want to recognize the other folks from PVA here and thank you for your service to the, to the country as well. Thanks a lot. Dave, go ahead. Chairman Larson, Ranking Member Graves, and members of the subcommittee. Paralyzed Veterans of America thanks you for the opportunity to testify for this oversight hearing regarding implementation of the FAA Reauthorization Act of 2018. This legislation included many provisions that if properly implemented by the U.S. Department of Transportation, would improve the air travel experience of catastrophically disabled veterans and all people with disabilities. The Air Carrier Access Act is a civil rights law that protects not only PVA members, but are all honorably discharged veterans with catastrophic disabilities but also the rights of all individuals living with disabilities to access air travel. Unfortunately, PVA members routinely report incurring bodily harm in boarding and deplaning aircraft, and their wheelchairs, particularly power wheelchairs, are often damaged while stowed. Today's aircraft present a rather hostile environment for the many passengers with disabilities, which often results in profound consequences for passengers with disabilities. PVA Senior Vice President Charles Brown in attendance today in today's hearing, was severely injured earlier this year when he was dropped while attempting to board an aircraft. Mr. Brown fractured his tailbone and as a result of this incident and subsequently developed a skin breakdown and bone infection. As a result of these, his injuries, he spent three months as an inpatient at the spinal cord injury unit at the VA's medical center in Miami. Now he is very apprehensive about flying and drove to Washington, D.C. from South Florida to attend recent PVA meetings and events. Unfortunately, Mr. Brown's situation is not unique among PVA members. I, too, have experienced disability-related problems in air travel. In fact, problems with air travel are one of our most common complaints that we receive from our members. PVA was pleased to work with the members of the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee and other House Disability Champions on inclusion of several disability-related provisions in the FAA Re Reauthorization Act of 2018. The law included provisions that will inform air travel passengers about their rights under the ACAA, improve the assistance they receive from air carriers, and establish formal lines of communication between the air travel industry, the disability community, and the DOT to address barriers to air travel. The law also requires a forward-looking study designed to determine the feasibility of passengers flying while in their wheelchairs. In the interest of time, we'd like to discuss only a few of these provisions, section 440, included requirement for the secretary to determine whether the regulations governing training programs for assisting passengers, like paralyzed veterans, 
are sufficient and whether hands-on training should be part of the regular required training regimen. It's unconscionable to think that someone with spinal cord injury or disorder should be assisted in multiple transfers to board and subsequently deplane an aircraft without having been properly educated. It is dangerous for not only those passengers, but also for those who are assisting them. The experience of many of our members who have been injured during this process is evidence enough for PVA to that incur current regulations are not sufficient to guarantee safe passage for these passengers. Section 439 required the Secretary to establish an advisory committee on the air travel needs of passengers with disabilities. I'm pleased to report that the Secretary publicly announced the formation of the Air Carrier Access Act Advisory Committee last Friday. PVA was honored to have a member of our national staff chosen to represent the disabled veterans on this committee. We're hopeful that one of the committee's tasks will be to assist the Secretary in the development of Airline Passengers with Disabilities Bill of Rights required in Section 434. I also want to highlight our support for a general consumer provision and the FAA reauthorization that required GAO to study laboratory access on aircraft. When I fly, I purposely dehydrate myself to the limit that poss a possibility that I might need to use a laboratory while on the aircraft because they are not accessible for people with mobility impairments. This is a typical protocol for many members of PVA's executive committee who are here in the audience today. When, when I fly from Washington, D.C. to my home and from West, Reston, Washington, I intentionally book flights that require layovers in the middle of the country so that I will not have to deprive myself of using a laboratory on a cross-country flight. Even then, I only allow myself to begin rehydrating once the flight is approximately 30 minutes from landing. The dignity of being able to access a laboratory cannot be underestimated and should not be measured against the cost of doing so. If laboratories are going to be made available on commercial aircraft, then they should be accessible to all passengers. The FAA Reauthorization Act represented an important step forward in efforts to improve the air travel experience of passengers with disabilities. However, more, remake, more work remains to be done. We want air carriers to do the right thing. Many times that means we need Congress and the Department of Transportation to guide them. PVA thanks you for this opportunity to express our views and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Mr. Flew. Um, <clears throat> I'll start um, my questions uh, with, uh, with Mr. Zerflu, the reauthorization bill directs the DOT to actually as well study the feasibility of in-cabin wheelchair restraint systems to cut down on the need to transfer folks from a wheelchair to a seat. Um, can you elaborate at all on how an in-cabin wheelchair restraint would change the flying experience with passengers with disabilities? I can give you several. Um, Mr. Larson, I've been both a witness and experienced it personally. Um, a couple years ago, I'd, I'd fallen and hurt my hip. And the one scary thing that these individuals face is that the aisle chair when you go, go down the back of an aircraft. Um, I had hurt my hip, and I was scared that the people weren't trained to, do, to properly lift me into that seat, so I chose to do it myself the best I could. Um, the individuals that were taking me back weren't paying attention. They banged my leg on every aisle chair about 15 rows back. And the, the pain was so intense, but I had an event that I promised I would, I would come to DC for, and so I, made, I delivered on that promise. <coughs> um, Ernie Butler also experienced similar situations, and he would, instead of being on an aisle chair, grab the back of chairs, he'd get his wheelchair as close as he could into the cabin, grab the back of the seats, kind of bunny hop himself to wherever he needed to be for fear that he, they would injure him like they did in the past. He did this probably 40 times before his passing, but it was, Everybody here to my left has those stories and experienced that situation, and the fear of getting on an aisle chair is, is immense to all of us. In your uh, written testimony, I believe in your written in yours, uh, you recount the number of uh, wheelchair uh, damage reports. Uh, is that was that in your written statement? Yeah, I don't have the exact number, but it's in the thousands. Yeah. Okay. I just wanted to highlight that um, <clears throat> for uh, for the committee. Actually, um, tens of thousands to be more specific. Okay. If I keep talking, it might be 100,000. Yeah. Um, uh, so, uh, uh, thank you. Um, Mr. Walden, um, uh, was just during your testimony, I was talking to the staff a little bit about the uh, pilot, uh, integration pilot program, and the fact that we gave direction 
to FAA to run that for two years. Uh, do you have any thoughts about whether or not it needs to be extended um, beyond uh, the two-year legal limit? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, in my uh, opening remarks, I mentioned that uh, success has been uneven. We've had reports. There are some um, participants that have beyond visual on a site authority that are engaged in package delivery and only one for compensation or higher. Um, other test sites are, um, other IP participants have not been, not been that active and it's been taking a long time to get waivers. So uh, we would recommend not only that the program be extended but be broadened. Uh, I think when the secretary announced the initial selection, it was the, the idea that others would be selected at a later time. There are a number of, of, uh, of applicants that were very well qualified. Um, with the matter, with regard to most of the IP programs, they were de-scoped at the start, mm -hmm. um, so that if you, if an IPP said, well, we're selected, we've got 15 projects, then the FA says, well, we'll go with three right now. And that left a lot of, a lot of good work not done. So it needs, to, it needs to have more FA resources, it needs to be extended, it needs to be broadened. Uh, Ms. Nelson, you testified that th three airlines now have, uh, your members have negotiated a, in the agreements um, a 10-hour rest rule and, and Delta's made an announcement as well. Um, any concerns that, not so much that the market's getting ahead of the FAA, but that, um, that the FAA is, is, behind, um, uh, is behind the market and in, in that, uh, um, Will the FAA be able to develop a 10-hour rest rule that conforms to what your members in the airlines are actually negotiating? Well, we have negotiated is language that mirrors what was written in the law. So it is the exact same. There's, there's no conflict there at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I should also note that Horizon Air yeah. has agreed to implement this outside of contract negotiations as well. Mm -hmm. But that there is a big difference between having negotiated contract language and having a regulation that the airlines must follow and um, must follow through with and expect that there will be enforcement from the FAA. There are many more higher penalties for violating that as opposed to uh, committing a contract violation. So this, this um, we have been able to determine that there is not a cost factor of note to this that the implementation can take place in a matter of weeks, actually, is what we have been experiencing. And that all that the FAA needs to do, based on all of the data that we already have from the seven commissioned fatigue studies and from the data that we have compiled here, is simply follow the direction of Congress to update the rule and force the airlines to implement the rest. All right. Thank you. I uh, recognize Mr. Fitzpatrick for uh, five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to uh, all the panelists for being here. I want to start with uh, Ms. Nelson. Um, first off, Ms. Nelson, thank you for your, um, your passion uh, and fighting for uh, the health, safety, and equality of the people you represent. You're doing a great job, and I can say that firsthand. Um, you had mentioned uh, the recent GAO study um, that identified ongoing problems facing passenger service agents. What steps do you believe uh, that need to be taken, both us on the committee uh, and those implementing it, um, in light of that report? The GAO study uh, confirms what we already know, that customer service agents experience verbal and physical harassment regularly. And so what needs to happen is that most airlines have not complied with what is in the act, and that is to develop assault incident protocol uh, that where they have clear uh, a clear process for handling assault when it happens, training for those customer service agents, and signage that makes it clear to the public what the penalties are um, if they conduct in this kind of uh, behavior. Now, I will tell you from firsthand experience that I came around the corner on an evening in an airport where there were severe storms and flights were being canceled everywhere. Because staffing has been reduced both on the plane and at the gates to the lowest level, there was one customer service agent handling, reporting that a flight was going to be canceled that night, 
And there was a family of five that were going on their vacation who were there to scratch up her arms so badly that blood was dripping from her arms by the time I got there. There was no other airline personnel there to see it. There was no law enforcement to respond. And she was in shock coming around the corner having been by herself. If we are going to take this seriously, then the airlines need to take this seriously with the protocol um, that they are required to submit to the FAA. The FAA needs to engage and enforce this portion of the act. And um, we need to be very clear in aviation from the highest levels of leadership into, down to the signage at our airports that a, uh, assault of a customer service agent is a felony. People will be held accountable. We bring a, a coordinated roundtable with law enforcement at the airports, and we all understand what the protocol is to respond. That is the only way that we are going to stop what is happening and is an epidemic in our airports. And as flight attendants, we want this to be addressed because we do not need these passengers who are already expressing incredible aggressive behavior to slip through the cracks and get onto our planes. This is a very serious issue, and it needs to be taken more seriously. Thank you, Ms. Nelson. Um, Captain Fox, um, you are a subject matter expert in an area that you heard me <clears throat> question Mr. Elwell about uh, secondary barriers. Thank you for your advocacy for that. Uh, and Ms. Nelson, perhaps you can opine on this as well. Uh, give us your perspective, uh, representing the airline pilots and the flight attendants on the, as of now, failure to implement what we passed uh, in the FAA reauthorization. Um, and that's only on new aircraft. As you know, we're fighting for retrofitting as well. If you could just share your thoughts on that, sir. Appreciate it. So thank you for the oversight and pressure from this committee, because clearly, from my standpoint of view, it's going to be required to get this law mandated um, out there and implemented. It's our, it's our opinion that forming this advisory committee working group right now, the FAA is looking at secondary barriers, is a waste of resources that they have. This work was done by a federal advisory group group, RTCA, back in 2008, and they produced the document that is the performance standard to implement this secondary barrier from 50 seats up to the 787. And when the assistant administrator addressed that it also the flight attendant piece was in there, the flight attendant piece was in there, but it was in there for an interim period of time until the secondary barrier was put in place. They have the costing data. They, have, they know how to certify to put it in the airplanes. It needs to be done right now. They can issue tomorrow an interim final rule, an IFR. They can issue an interim final rule tomorrow to implement this law and take comments. And that's what I think should happen. What do you suspect the reason is for the delay? There's, it's pure and simple. The reason, in, in our opinion, is there's special interest. The ones that have been fighting us all along to do what's right are out there right now fighting again. And to me, it's a disrespect to, this, to the Congress that passed that law. It's a disrespect to Ellen Saracini, who's in the room today, and to my friends who won Flight 175 with her husband, Captain Victor Saracini. 18 years later, this is too long. The flight attendants who are standing there using their own bodies as a guard against the flight deck thought that they were doing that for an interim period of time. And we need these secondary barriers. They were on planes. There were uh, decisions that were made by some of the airlines to remove them from pre-installed uh, secondary barriers that were on new aircraft that were designed. And they did that for cost reasons. Aviation safety and security is written in blood. And 18 years is long enough. We need to get this done. And I appreciate your leadership and your passion on this issue to make sure that it happens. Thank you. And um, I asked my committee members and colleagues to really take note of this. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. I'm going to turn to uh, Representative Garcia from uh, Illinois. Thank Five you. Minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank all the panelists for their testimony. So I represent a, a lot of hardworking, working class people in my district, folks who work day and night to make ends meet. When I learned about the long hours, often uncompensated, that flight attendants endure, I was really surprised. Uh, people think it's kind of a glamorous job uh, still. Even more so uh, to find out that the meager changes made to flight attendants' uh, adequate rest has been delayed. Uh, can you, uh, Ms. Nelson, provide with any additional comments about the strains that this puts on individuals, 
your families, staff morale, and performance, and separately, what impacts this may have on safety of the uh, flying public? Thank you very much for the question. Um, flight attendants are aviation's first responders, and they must be prepared to respond immediately. They switch back and forth between being safety professionals and serving with incredible emotional intelligence to be able to handle all of the people on board. Oftentimes, we have to de-escalate conflict, and when we don't get enough rest, it is much harder to do that. It is much harder to respond to any safety issue. I have a re another report from a flight attendant who said that she was so fatigued from a short night that she forgot to do the safety demo on the plane. So these, oftentimes, the flight attendants who are experiencing these short nights and long days are typically the more junior flight attendants. You brought up the issue of pay. These are people who are having to work long hours, not make enough money, and one of the issues of fatigue is also not getting enough nutrition. Oftentimes, they don't have enough money to eat. These are the same people who are not getting enough rest to avoid fatigue and perform the very serious safety and security functions that they must perform. I mentioned earlier uh, responding to a medical emergency. We are also trained that a medical emergency could be a diversion for a much more serious security attack. And we have to remain vigilant to all of these issues on board, in addition to managing all the different uh, personalities on board that sometimes don't always get along. So um, this is a very serious stress. It happens every single day, and we continue to receive reports from flight attendants who are under great strain in their own personal health um, and in their ability to perform their safety duties and respond in an evacuation, and um, also in uh, their home lives, because when they go home, they're, they're beat, and they often then have to take care of children or other responsibilities. Uh, can you comment, uh, Ms. Nelson, on the seat sizes and uh, space between uh, rows? Uh, the case that has been mentioned here uh, at uh, American Airlines Flight 383 at Chicago O'Hare is, I think, a, a, an occasion that raises uh, much concern about this. Um, can you elaborate on efforts to put more passengers on planes and how this may jeopardize safety? Yes, we are very much in support of the evacuation certification standard study, and in fact, we think we need to move forward uh, with uh, addressing the very real conditions in the cabin today. Our, we suspect that the 90-second rule cannot be met with the current conditions on board if you were to conduct an actual evacuation certification. Um, and in real time with real people who weren't told ahead of time or volunteered and come to the uh, test with tennis shoes on um, and a uh, good breakfast in their belly and um, being prepared to respond because they know that's why they're there. Um, so we um, are very concerned about the shrinking seats um, more and more people being packed on our planes, closer and closer together, and no realistic assessment of um, today's passenger size or the conditions in the cabin that include having uh, personal electronic devices plugged in everywhere, um, people stuffing in their overhead uh, baggage everywhere. These evacuation certification tests have never taken into consideration the bags that people are taking with them today. And um, so there is not a realistic assessment, and we believe um, that that is going to lead to a loss of life if we don't take uh, action right now to correct it. Thank you. Uh, I yield my time, uh, Chairman. Thank you. Recognize uh, <clears throat> Ranking Member Graves for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is mainly, and this goes back to, uh, uh, to GA and it's to, uh, uh, to Mr. Baker. Um, and from a pilot's perspective, I guess you might say, um, what can we do or what should we be focusing on when it comes to our um, medium and smaller airports uh, to make sure they're viable, um, to make sure that they're part of, um, um, you know, an uh, aviation system, you know, that aviation system throughout the country that, you know, we just want to make sure that they continue to function and, because without those, then, you know, obviously we crowd up, you know, the larger airports. We want to make sure that that's, uh, uh, that's maintained. But from your perspective, you know, what do we need to be focusing on? What do we need to be doing to do a better job when it comes to smaller airports? 
Well, thank you, uh, Congressman Graves, for that question. Yeah, these 5,000 public use airports, which airlines use around 500, the other ones are, as you know, small, rural, and sort of the outer rings of the cities, if you will, are very important to this infrastructure system. It was well intended by this Congress to have money set aside, uh, AIP funds, for these airports. And unfortunately, there's a match caused out there that some cities, some communities that are stressed cannot afford to match those things. They get to roll over $150,000 for a couple of years, and too often that money goes unspent, well intended by this Congress to have those investments. But I think we have to really look at, are there ways to help these communities invest in this incredible infrastructure that we have uniquely in this country, from everything from paramedic relief to agriculture to business to community access, um, these are important investments. We've got to figure out how to help that match come down to some of these key uh, airports, as you well know. There's 3,000 of them that have that entitlement opportunity. I'm going to pivot a little bit now, too, when it comes to, to GA and ADSB um, and the requirements for that. And we've still got a lot of GA aircraft out there that aren't equipped, and we've got a deadline that's coming up um, very, very quickly. And are you concerned about that? Do you think that? People are just waiting to see what happens with the price because it is expensive. Um, there's a couple options out there, but it is extraordinarily expensive to equip. Um, you know, is what are your thoughts? Well, you know, the, uh, the ADSB equipment out mandate, which is, starts January of this year, is very concerning. We have about 87,000 aircraft that probably will be equipped by that point in time, leaving about 70-some thousand aircraft that use that airspace that are close to the cities or above 10,000 feet that won't be equipped as of January 1, most likely. The cost of the equipment has come down, but as we all know here, the average age of an aircraft today is 45 years old. We've got a quartile that are less than $40,000 in total value. And this equipment was running between two and $6,000 to put on these airplanes. General aviation owners have spent over a billion and a half dollars so far to be participating in this mandate. The FAA had a $500 rebate program in place it expired, uh, it was very helpful for a lot of these owners that are doing this for the betterment of the system, for traffic. Um, they don't have to do this, they want to do this, we encourage them to do it, but I would really encourage that $500 rebate be reenacted. I'll yield back. Okay, I recognize uh, Representative Norton for five minutes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. It was important to hear from this panel. Um, I represent uh, a region which has two major airlines. Uh, my question, I suppose, is for Mr. I am I pronouncing this right, Brayholt? Mr. Brayholt, um, I have special interest in your testimony about family seating, and that's not only, as you indicated, for convenience. Uh, a Republican... Uh, uh, not on this committee, but a uh, Republican co-sponsor and I, Rick Crawford, uh, have sponsored a bill. We're calling it the, the AWARE Act that uh, mandates that uh, the FBI record, the FBI uh, look at sexual assaults on airlines, on cruise ships, uh, sli uh, ships, other forms of transportation, and disaggregate that information so we know where these assaults, apparently there is some information uh, that, but not disaggregated so we know what we're talking about. Um, this bill, my bill, would go before the Judiciary Committee, its subcommittee on crime, terrorism, uh, and Homeland Security. I have a special interest because I was a former chair of the Equal Employment U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which wrote the first guidelines on sexual harassment and assault. And th those guidelines probably don't even apply. In the, uh, well, they may, but I am not even sure how they apply in the context of transportation, and I note that in your testimony, Mr. Grealt, on page five, you say that uh, section 2309, that is apparently of our 2016 FAA reauthorization bill mandated 
and here I'm quoting that within a year after enactment, the DOT review and if appropriate, create rules requiring airlines to seat children age 13 or under next to an accompanied family member. This would seem to be much more urgent given what we now know about sexual assaults uh, on airlines and I think your testimony that even children had been sexually assaulted. Do you have any, I mean have, do you have any information whatsoever on whether the airlines have been approached? I mean that's two years, uh, that's three years ago uh, when we mandated that uh, these rules be created. Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, as I mentioned in my oral statement, my colleagues at Consumer Reports Magazine uh, recently released uh, records of their interactions with the Department of Transportation over just this issue. And from what I understand, uh, the DOT looked at the mandate in the bill, uh, which also includes, I believe, uh, uh, as, some, uh, as appropriate message, uh, as a loop, basically a legislative loophole from our opinion, uh, looked at the number of complaints that they were receiving about uh, family seating, uh, and decided that what they wanted to do would be to create a consumer education website about family seating. Based on what we've been able to tell, uh, to see, uh, there has been very little uh, substantive research in terms of talking to family advocates, psychologists, uh, much beyond uh, looking at the, uh, how many complaints they've gotten and making a determination that the percentage of complaints... Of course, complaints this, this mandated a rule. I'm sorry? Uh, you indicated in your testimony their website. Yes. Uh, have they indicated anything about the mandate from this committee for a rule? I understand that what they have done is create a website, and I believe that that's how they believe they have uh, successfully uh, 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 applied the rule, applied the mandate that Congress has given them. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, um, Mr. Chairman, could I ask that the uh, committee write to uh, Department of Transportation. This is three years ago we mandated a rule. We've had testimony here. They've created a website. Uh, we have had testimony here of sexual assaults on uh, airplanes. Now that's bad enough for anybody, but involving children does seem to me that the committee should be in touch not only about the tardiness, but about the effect of this tardiness uh, on children and other passengers on airlines. And I ask that a a, uh, that, that whether in a letter or however the chairman suit that we, we, uh, we, we reach the airlines to get a prompt answer. Uh, yeah, I'll make a note of that and we'll have our staff follow up with you so we can get the appropriate uh, communication out. Thank you. Very Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, final question, Mr. Wald, in your written testimony, you mentioned the importance of risk-based decision-making when it comes to UAS integration. Uh, you go on to state that you're concerned that the FAA may be approaching risk in an overly conservative way. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, thank you for your question. Um, in the uh, proposed rule to allow operations over people, the FAA adopts a risk model that assumes a drone has hit a person. And whether the drone would be able to fly over people depends on the severity of that impact. That's not the test in manned aviation, where you look at the probability of failure, the probability of impact, and then the, then the severity of the injury. That's the holistic risk model that, that uh, has been recommended by uh, peer-reviewed uh, groups, uh, recommended by the Centers for Excellence that assure, uh, and we are hoping that the FAA will reconsider that proposed rule. Uh, it, will, it wants to time that proposed rule with the remote ID final rule, and so there is time for the FAA to adopt um, a risk uh, model that is the one that uh, is co consistent with manned aviation. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, before I close, I want to just make a note of uh, how much overlap there was between the questions the members asked of the FAA and the DOT and the issues that you yourselves have brought up. So it seems that the, at, least, uh, at least at this point, there, we seem to be on track with the stakeholders um, with regards to pressing the FAA on the right things. 
Uh, we'll continue to try to do that. You, the testimony you provided has been good direction uh, to the full committee, uh, as well as uh, certainly to the subcommittee. Uh, I know it's late. I know I haven't had lunch, and I'm sure some of you want to have lunch as well. So uh, with that, uh, we have a lot of work left to do, um, and I really appreciate uh, this panel's efforts. And I ask unanimous consent as well today that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing. Any unanimous consent, uh, any objections? Okay. Uh, and unanimous consent for th that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection, so ordered. If I don't have anything to add, uh, the subcommittee now stands adjourned.